Okay. Today is Spider-Man Day. Are you ready? <laughs> oh my goodness, so many paintings around this house. I got all my Van Gogh paintings stacked up everywhere. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski. We are going to make, be making another painting by another one of my all-time very favorite artists. He is the co-creator of one of the most popular, most iconic characters in the world. His name is Steve Ditko, and along with Stanley created the Amazing Spider-Man back in 1962. So let's get right into today's episode because it's a big one. I'm really excited to make today's painting. If you've been painting along with me for a little while, you know that my idea of what constitutes art is quite broad and varied. We have painted the Mona Lisa, we've painted Salvador Dali, we've pa painted Fra Angelico, we've painted a lot of the greatest artists of all time, and I would include today's artist, Steve Ditko, along with them. Yes, he's a comic book illustrator, but I don't have those same hang-ups over painting being high art and comic books being low art. I think whatever human expression, if, it's, uh, if, if it inspires people, it gets people excited, uh, and wants and encourages people to maybe pursue their own dreams of becoming an artist, I consider that great art. And Steve Ditko is uh, no different. So this is the image we're going to paint today. And I'll let you know, this is an outline that you can download from a Dropbox folder and then print out and then transfer onto a canvas. Now, you're going to notice it's a little bit different than the original. Um, you're certainly welcome to paint the background as Steve did co-painted. You can see here's his little signature right there, the SD. Um, I, however, am going to put some bricks on the wall uh, because Spider-Man is, is known for climbing up and down the sides of walls in, and buildings in uh, New York where the character is based. But um, I just I, this is the way I'm going to make the painting. It's not too much different uh, than this, uh, but I, I was a little confused as to what this image was. I assume it's also probably the side of a building and he took some creative liberties to it. This is the original, original image as it appeared in Amazing Spider-Man uh, Annual number one from 19, I think October 1964. That's the cover, which he also illustrated. Um, and then this was like a I'm trying to remember if this was at the back of the comic or the very front of the comic. Anyway, that's uh, the cover. And then this is probably the most famous image uh, that Steve Ditko illustrated of Spider-Man flying through the air holding this criminal. This is the actual first appearance of Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy number 15. Um, I, I was sort of, I couldn't decide which image to do even though this is maybe the most iconic one. Personally, I thought this, when I think of Spider-Man, I think of him crawling on a wall, not sort of flying through the air like um, uh, Superman or something, even though he is swinging. I just thought that this, I, anyway, you feel free to paint whatever you like. This is what I'm gonna paint today. So uh, let's get right to it, because I wanna show you how you, where you can find this, uh, this Dropbox image. If you click on a link down below, you'll see a whole bunch, you'll see a, a Dropbox folder, and inside that Dropbox folder for Master Study, which is the the series that we're, we're doing presently here, you'll see images, as I said, Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa here, Salvador Dali, Frangelico, um, Robert Bateman, you wanna paint, learn how to paint an eagle, there you go, we painted Batman by Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Right. Uh, Ralph McQuarrie, who did the original Star Wars, that might be up your alley. If you want something for little kids, we did the Peppa Pig and Joe Schuster's 
uh, Superman. Joe Schuster was the illustrator along with his good buddy Siegel. Um, Sheldon Cohen's hockey sweater is another illustration that we've done. Anyway, here we go. There we go. We did a whole week of Van Gogh just last week. And then here's where we are, Steve Ditko. And you can also see some of the other artworks coming down the pipeline, some of which may be very familiar to you, and then some of which might be totally brand new to you. I mean, that's the whole point, is I want to... I think all of these are great artists, um, but some of them might be unfamiliar to some of you. So let's, uh, let's explore. Here, inside the Steve Ditko folder, you're going to see three files. You're going to see the outline as a JPEG and a PDF. That's why... And then you're, you'll see this image. So that's why there's three different files. The JPEG and PDF are essentially the same, just different file formats for your printer. I'll also let you know that there is a private Facebook group just for people who, like yourself, are painting along with me. I encourage you to join the group. It grows a couple people every week here. And I don't let everybody in. Sometimes I, do, I kind of do a little dive and see, is this a legit person or not? And it looks like we've got a bunch of legit people who aren't trying to sell you some brain pills or something, right? Um, and it's so cool because I get to see the work that you guys are making. So here's Eleanor's version of the Van Gogh portrait we did just uh, on Thursday. That's awesome. And Stefan's here. Wow, that's super cool. And I just want to say, like he says here... Uh, I'm working for the first time on something of my own. I never thought I could do it without the instructions, but Michael's lessons are slowly being absorbed. <laughs> That's awesome. That's That makes me so happy. And every... Actually, not this weekend, but the weekend after, we're going to be doing a feedback session where we look at the work that you guys have created, not just the versions of the paintings we do in our class, but like Stefan here, the artwork that you do outside of the class that you ins feel inspired to do now that you have a little bit more confidence as an artist. That's great. Way to go, Stefan. Okay, let's move on here. I want to talk uh, really briefly about Steve Ditko, and we're going to talk as the, the class goes here. Born in 1927 in Pennsylvania, and he died just a few years ago here in New York City. So lived a long life, age 90, and was making art comic books almost all the way up until the end even though he did claim to have retired in the late 90s but he was still producing small things here and there um let me see he, he's a fascinating enigmatic character one of the 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 most unusual figures in comic book history creator history um, as we're going to talk about here, because he basically walked away from Spider-Man at the height of its early um, fame in, I think, 1966. Just one day, you know, came in as he would every every couple days with the new artwork that he had made and would drop it off with the secretary at uh, Marvel Comics and be on his way, and he just walked in with a bunch of finished artworks and said, today's my last day, I quit walked out the door to this day uh no one had any has any clue exactly why he left marvel comics but um after that went on to do a lot of minor uh illustrate minor characters for dc comics which was the competitor to marvel comics and then also illustrated like random stuff like mighty morphin power rangers uh, so a pretty bizarre, I, I will say, and we'll get into it here, um, he did spend, he got really into the philosophy of Ayn Rand, who you may have heard of from the Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged, uh, that objectivism, which is a kind of a controversial um, philosophy or way of life. That we'll talk about if you if you've never heard of Ayn, Ayn Rand, um, uh, we'll, it's uh, basically the the philosophy is about super selfishness, right? And this I and it's been absorbed a lot recently. You may have heard it, um, some of the Republican politicians in the United States over the past 10, 15 years talking about it. So. Um, it's also, if you've read The Fountainhead, it's about this idea of like never compromising, never making any sacrifices as an artist 
and I think that was a big part of why he left Marvel Comics was some disagreements he fundamental disagreements he had with Stan Lee um, over just like the story and how he felt it he wanted it to, to be a little bit more uh, closely aligned with his personal growing personal beliefs in objectivism anyway let's move on here he created spider-man that's by far the character he's most associated with uh, and it is interesting I was just watching a great documentary just uh, a couple days ago called in search of Steve Ditko here by the British presenter Jonathan Ross it's on YouTube in search of Steve Ditko it's about an hour long and it is interesting because I won't uh, play it but right around here here's Stanley uh, oh now we're gonna get an ad <laughs> uh, but Stanley in that documentary reluctantly or he says he's happy to acknowledge that that uh, Steve Ditko was the co-creator of Spider-Man even though he doesn't believe Steve Ditko was the co-creator of Spider-Man Stanley believes he is the creator because he thought up the idea of Spider-Man and gave the ideas to Steve Ditko and Steve Ditko put those ideas onto paper Stanley believes that that makes him the creator of Spider-Man and that he could have just got anybody to come up with the look of Spider-Man. Anyway, whether you agree with that or not is something we can talk about throughout the episode. What do you think? Does the person who comes up with the idea, are they the sole creator of, like, is, another example would be Elon Musk. Did he invent the Tesla car or SpaceX? Or is he the co-creator along with all the engineers? Same thing with Steve Jobs. Uh, you might say comic books and, and iPhones. What's the similarity? I would say there's actually a lot of things in common. Um, other things that, that is acknowledged that Steve Ditko did create are, are many of the supporting characters that uh, form the Spider-Man universe, including the gruff J. Jonah Jameson, um, his girlfriend, romantic interest here, Gwen, Stef uh, Gwen Stacy, I was going to say Gwen Stefani, <laughs> Mary Jane Watson, and then the main foes, Dr. Octopus, Green Goblin, and Venom, who's also a, a major film um, franchise in and of itself. I'll also just move on really quickly. The other second most famous character Steve Ditko is is really well known for creating is Doctor Strange, uh, played most recently in a film starring Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, and uh, also I mean, it's definitely a, a more minor character in the Marvel universe who's become much more famous. Um, I think let's let's dive right into this and get the get our painting started. I have already applied the outline to my canvas here and I'm going to show you how to do that I'm going to I have a pre-recorded this basically all I did is I just downloaded this off of the Dropbox onto regular photocopy paper printed it out and then I use some carbon paper to uh, transfer it so let's uh, because he felt I used take a look at this I'm gonna play it while I talk over top of it so you can see there's the carbon paper there on the left there's the photocopied image or the printout from inkjet or laser jet printer doesn't matter what uh, type of uh, how you print it out or what type of paper I like kind of thicker paper but certainly feel free to, to paint to print it out onto thinner paper the thinner the paper is, the easier it is to do this carbon paper transfer process. I also, you can see me here just trying to make sure that these lines on the, the brick wall are relatively straight. They don't have to be perfectly straight, but if they're really wildly crooked, it could just drive you absolutely bonkers, right? So I'm happy with that. Put the tape down, move the pencils out of the way. Let's get some carbon paper under here. You can see that carbon paper has been used a number of times. If you look closely, you can see some of the Van Gogh images from last week on there. I put it underneath. I usually push it to the top left corner so that I can make sure I get all those lines. Um, and then pick out a colored pencil. You could use colored pens. I would strongly recommend you use 
something of, of color just so that you can see which lines you've traced. And you'll see here, I do mostly just the outsides. I do a little bit of the lines, but not all of the webbing on here. So here we go. Let's just take a quick look. See, that's what it looks like when I lift up the the carbon paper and the template. Right? And then here, I'm going to turn the paper onto its side. And then I'm going to get a different colored pencil, and I'm going to get a ruler here. And I'm going to start making these lines. And you can see I turned the carbon paper onto its side so it would extend just a little bit more. And then that way I can draw the line over top of this. Then move the carbon paper down, move the carbon paper up. And... After I've got all those lines done... Uh, because it's brick, I want to get these uh, interlocking bricks done, right? And this is a, maybe a little bit of a mind warp uh, to try to get these lines done on here. It actually took me a while to do this on the, the computer. Uh, I use Procreate on my iPad Pro. Um, and I just did a whole bunch of lines and then did these extra uh, vertical lines on top. When he brought me the pages. And you can see I'm drawing, I did those lines right through the Spider-Man's body. So here we go. Right, that's what it looks like. Move your paper out of the way, and da-da! Okay, so let's get right into it. We've got our... Um, our canvas that's already prepped. I think what I'm going to do is, as the bricks keep on getting higher up here, well, this will turn into kind of a blur, and I'll show you a little bit how I do that. I'm going to save the uh, outline for the future because I like recycling them and reusing them. Okay, so let's get some paint out onto the table. I see a bunch of new names in the chat there, so that's exciting. A whole bunch of new people joining to paint along with me today. Um, I use, a, I've kind of got a system that I've been using for years now, uh, of a particular set of colors and um, these colors, if you want to know which exact tubes of paint that I'm using, there's links in the description below. You can buy them directly from Amazon if you wish. If you don't have, if you don't want to get this particular brand of paint, this is the Amsterdam. I'm not sponsored by anybody. I'm not getting any money from anybody for, for promoting them or anything. I just like them because they're relatively inexpensive and pretty high quality for the price. You could certainly spend a lot more. Each of those big tubes is about um, uh, ten dollars, ten to fifteen dollars, depending on the actual color itself. So, and with that, you can make about. I've had to replace these tubes once over the past. Today is painting number one hundred and eight. So. We made 108 paintings with those tubes of paint, which together add up to about a hundred bucks. So, for to make 50 paintings out of an investment of a hundred bucks, I'd say that's a pretty good, right? Like, and that can keep you busy for a while. If if you're like me and you've made. 50 paintings took about, uh, we were painting basically twice a week. So, you know, four to six, seven paintings a month. You do the math how long it'll take you to make 50 paintings. Okay. Steve, I just wanted to say hello and thank you so much. Okay. I also, once I, so I'm putting this yellow onto the surface of the canvas. I, this is how I prep all of my canvases. Sometimes I use a slightly different color, and usually if I use a different color, I'll, I'll mention why. Um, but, and I, in some of the previous episodes, I used to do that much more frequently, to use different colors. And then over time, it was just like, you know what, I think this works just as well. 
no. and because we're going to obviously paint over everything you see here so having um, slightly different colors is going to make a minor difference and of course some people say well if the difference is so minor why even bother painting yellow to begin with well, anybody, if no one's going to know, then this just seems like a big waste of time. Um, I, I would counter that just because you don't know that you're looking at it or that you see it doesn't mean that you're not seeing it, right? Uh, in the same way, if you, were, you go to a, a nice restaurant and you're eating some kind of food and you're like, hmm. What is in these uh, spring rolls? What's that flavor? I, I don't know. And then you ask the, the waiter, like, oh, it's, um, uh, I don't know, um, celery or something. The chef cuts little mini pieces of celery. And you're like, oh, that's so interesting, that texture. I, I knew there was something there. I just couldn't put my finger on it, right? Same thing with this process. It's going to give the painting a bit of that extra glow. Okay, so we're going to let this dry for just a couple of uh, minutes, putting the water in it, and that's really the only time I ever put water in my painting, um, helps to increase or speed up that drying time just a little bit, but I don't want to put um, uh, water in my acrylic paints beyond that because it's going to thin the paints out, it's going to make them dry a little bit faster, and... I don't know about you, but for the most part, um, acrylic paints dry almost too fast. Especially right now, it's really hot. We're going through another heat wave here in Vancouver, Canada, where I am. And um, so, if anything, one instead of my paints drying too fast, I would like them to take a little bit longer to dry. So here's. A material that you can use. This is called slow dry medium, and um, you might also see it in different brands. It's called uh, paint retarder, and you can use that if you're finding the paint is drying really, really fast. I, I actually find that when it's really, really hot, the slow dry medium actually doesn't really help too much. I mean, it, it slows the paint from drying, but I don't like the way the paint behaves too much um, when when it's really hot and I've got the slow dry medium in there. Anyway, well, so these are the colors that I've put on my palette. So I've got two yellows, two reds, two blues. You'll see that they they're labeled. I got a warm yellow, a cool yellow, a warm red, and a cool red warm blue and a cool blue right because um, there's we want to use warm colors in the foreground to make things look close warm colors will advance towards the viewer or the picture plane and cold colors recede they go backwards right so we want to try to use those different um, uh, uh, hues to create this um, what Hans Hoffman called the push-pull effect where just the colors on their own start creating space it's a great little technique that um, will transform your paintings it takes a little bit of mental gymnastics to fully understand it and hopefully if you're just painting along with me at a certain point you're just like oh yeah it makes total sense I <laughs> so it's just one of those things right um, Okay, looks like this is still a little bit wet, so I'm going to mute the microphone for just about 10 seconds, hit it with the, uh, the uh, blow dryer, and that uh, will we'll cake this uh, paint on here. So... So much power. I mean, there's images that I can't ever get out of my head. He was, he's one of, the, one of the absolute major titans to do American power. Even when he was doing primitive stuff, he was getting dynamics. He was getting stretch. When he started to hit his prime in the FF, there was mass. You know, he could make just the, the simple act of one guy hitting another guy in the face look like, you know, a cosmic calamity.
<laughs> uh, thanks for the the comments there in the chat uh, about the. That, I think that was the video that I was saying that in search of Steve Ditko playing on YouTube. Uh, remember, I paused it and then it, it just decided it wanted to start playing again. It was it wanted to get in on the action. Uh, so <laughs> I appreciate uh, you guys letting me know in the comments that that video was still uh, had started up again. So I apologize for that if that was a little bit annoying. You're like, what on earth? Is that, uh, I'm competing with some British man in the background. That's pretty funny. Um, okay, wow, lots of chats, comments. Um, so, okay, let's let's get right into the painting here. Now, as uh, viewers, regular viewers will know that what I like to do is to begin with the background and then paint the foreground, not completely, and then go back to the background, finish the background, and then ultimately finish on the foreground. And when I say background, I mean, let's in this case, the brick, and even maybe the sh well, I think the, we'll do the bricks, and then we'll do the character of Spider-Man crawling on the bricks, including the shadow, go back, finish any details in the background that need to be finished, and then we'll just tighten up the foreground, and, and we should be done. So... The background is a little bit different, right? Like we're we're gonna uh, it's because I've decided I'm gonna change things up just a little bit. Um, uh, the original itself had we just look at this here had this big bright yellow. If you wanted to uh, to paint that, basically this yellow is your cold yellow, and it looks like a, kind of almost like a cool brown here as well. So to, to make that color, if you wanted, you could just use paint a whole bunch of this cool yellow, even on top of this warm uh, yellow. And then if you want that cool brown, then you would do cold yellow, cold blue, and cold red, right? Together are going to make a brown, right? And they're going to make a colder brown. Now we're going to do, we're going to make a cold brown as well for the background. Remember we want the background to be go backwards so and we're gonna paint the foreground in warm colors so it comes forward right so let's make a cold brown right so let's get started here let's let's begin with our cool yellow uh, where should we do this I think we might as well just do this right here we may even need a little bit more of it so let's put some more paint on it how we got some cool yellow and there's really no better best uh, order to do this so I'll just we can do we'll, we'll probably mix this a few times let's put some cold blue there and then I'm gonna scoop up some cold red as well and you can see this is the way that I typically work is I, I get my kind of paints together in an area of the canvas. Some people will use a palette knife to do this kind of thing. I personally find it's a little difficult to use a palette knife on a curved surface like this. Palette knives work much better on a large piece of glass, perhaps. Uh, anyway, so let's stir these colors together. So basically, if you mix three colors together of the same uh, color temperature, you're gonna get a brown. Now you can change the the type because you can also have many different kinds of brown. Like this brown we see right now is maybe a bit on the greenish side of things. Although this is that's pretty cool. I don't mind it. But I think I want a bit more of a warm like not a warmer, but a more reddish brown. Like we might see on bricks. Right? So let's actually gonna scoop some more yellow. And obviously, if I just mix this in right now, we've got much more of a yellowish brown, yellow greenish brown. And so that'll tell us if I don't like this and I think it's too green, then that tells me I've got probably too much blue and too much yellow. If I want it to be more of a reddish brown, let's add some more of this cool red in here. All right, and all of a sudden that color transforms. And you, you can decide on your own how red you want these bricks to be. I think we're going to probably have to do two coats of this. 
So, um, I'm not gonna obsess too much over uh, the exact mixture at this particular stage, but I think that that's gonna work pretty well. So let's just move this out of the way. And where should we begin? How about, let's just stop, stop. I wanna do the exact opposite, Michael. I wanna start, I'm gonna start right here at the top. You can see I'm using a big brush, right? And I'm not concerned about going over the pencil lines of Spidey's body here. Right, and this is the shadow. It could be a little bit confusing. I totally understand that. So hopefully as people see me painting, they'll be like, oh, okay, I see what's going on there. I was a little confused, but now it's making a little bit more sense. Uh, you can see me just wiping away. It's not because I, I'm, I don't like the paint on Spider-Man's body. It's just because I felt there was a little bit uh, too much there, building up a ridge. And that ridge is going to take longer to dry. And it might give some texture on there that could make detailing this figure a little bit tricky later on. So, so you can see I'm, I'm working pretty quickly here. That's the whole point of this stage of the painting process. Is to not uh, get stuck in the details. That's another reason why I use a nice big brush here. As a big brush makes it pretty hard to do details. So if, if it's too hard to do it, then you're just not going to do it, right? And that's what I want to do. I want to avoid the temptation to get lost and be, be perfectionist at such an early stage in the painting. So I'm just going to paint over the shadow. We're going to I'll show you how to darken the shadow as we go here. And do your best to get around these fingers, but don't worry about making them perfect. You want to move relatively quickly to avoid too many Another thing if you're painting with acrylics because they dry quite quickly um, you want to try to to be moving around if you're doing a big space like this uh, quite quickly so that um, you can let's like let's say this area here I want to try to make sure that that these brush strokes don't have too much uh, they can't set permanently until I until I want them to because otherwise sometimes you get these brush strokes that that uh, dry I want to be able to integrate all my brush strokes look at that almost perfect amount of paint sometimes I, I underestimate or I overestimate how much space that paint is gonna cover or how much surface area but definitely as I've been painting professionally for uh, I don't know, too long now, 25 years, I think, somewhere like that, 20, 20, plus 20 years, so I want to try to, uh, you, you just start to, to understand, like, how far paint will go, and also it depends on how, how thick you apply your paint, you can see that I've applied this paint kind of thin, um, I applied the paint kind of thin for a number of reasons. Um, one of which is if you're applying paint thin and you've got like a, a like underdrawing like this, then it then it's going to make it easier for you to see what's underneath uh, the paint. The thicker you apply the paint, the more likely it is that you're going to cover up what was all what was there, right? The other thing is thin paint's going to dry much faster. It doesn't cost as much because you're using less paint um, and it uh, yeah I think there are, I'm sure there's a few other ones there I can't quite remember so that's that's good I'm wondering if I want to do the next layer 
now or just let this dry? Usually right now what I would do is move on to the foreground. Which I think I'm going to do I'm, I think I'm going to put another layer of brown on top of this and then move on to the foreground. Uh, just because this is a, such a s relatively simple kind of image. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to mute the microphone again. I'm going to blow dry this. It'll take maybe 20 seconds for this to dry, and then we'll do a mix a couple. <laughs> uh, there's lots of things in the chat there. I just saw Donna saying, um, you make yourself sound old, Michael, when talking about how long you've been painting professionally. <laughs> it creeps up on you, doesn't it? Uh, those of us who were getting up on, on age. I remember there was, throughout my entire life, I was always the youngest person in my class. I was always the younger, like, youngest person on my hockey team, the youngest person on my baseball or soccer team. Um, because my birthday's in, in mid-September, so it's right around that cutoff time. I was always the youngest kid. I was the youngest person to ever go to my, to my graduate school where I've got my master's degree in Los Angeles. Uh, I, I was surrounded by people. I was 20 years old. I was surrounded by people in their mid-30s and 40s. And then it's so weird now to be kind of at this age where... I'm no longer the youngest person in the room. I'm sometimes the oldest person in the room. Okay, so let, I'm just going to mix this color again. And let's take a bit, uh, not so much blue. I think I'm going to make this one just a little bit more red, this mixture. And I think I'll get a little bit more paint. Now, the second time we do a coat, usually we don't need nearly as much paint. Um, because a few things is that this surface is getting smoother and smoother the more paint gets on there, right? So it doesn't have to fill in the little pockets of the weave of the canvas. So let's take this cool yellow. Remember, we're using cold colors to start. Got our cool yellow. I think we're going to need some more uh, cool red, but we'll just see what that looks like. Actually, uh, let's put a little bit more. A little bit more. That's good. I, it's possible, because I'm going to go back and work on the, the background again in about an hour, but um, I should just, let's give it even a little bit more red. There we go. You don't want to go too red, because then it might look a little bit strange, but I think, I think that's pretty good. Okay, um, it doesn't, uh, let's start down here in the bottom. So what I like about doing this, the second coat, is you see how all of a sudden it just looks more like a solid color, less kind of uh, painterly, which, you know, if you're, if you want that effect, go right ahead. Um, I certainly don't want to discourage if you at any point during these classes, you you like the way your painting looks and you want to just keep on going with it, that that uh, is um, that's really exciting for me to hear. I, I want you to feel that way. But if you're like, ah, I kind of want it to be a little bit more like the original, a little bit more cartoony looking, then you probably want a little bit more flat colors. 
If you want really, really flat colors, then you can do a third coat of this and you're more likely to get a really nice, um, solid uh, color. But um, I think I'm just gonna kind of move on after this layer. And if you want the smoothest one possible, then just take the image to your local printers and get it printed because you're you'll get a much smoother color on a digital printer than you almost ever will by doing this by hand so part of the the experience of making a painting is often embracing the handmade aspects of that paint a little bit of blue squeezed out on the bottom from my brush when I turned it around. I didn't quite like that so much, but see there's some more. So that just means I should just mix this. Whoa! See, I just took some of that. Hmm. Maybe I can use that somehow. Maybe it'll get a little more blue at the top. Wow, it is hot in here. I'm a little bit concerned because the previous episode shut down just... I was wrapping up and it shut down, so that was okay, but because the it got so hot down here that the computer bugged out. And I got, you can hear probably the fan running in the background. Whew. Yeah, I don't know. I don't mind it like that. It's a little bit patchy. Let me see. If, I'm, if I really don't like that, I just wipe off some excess paint with my brush. Again, I gotta move kind of quick because I can see this paint drying. And if you try to like brush paint like just like that that happened, you start brushing some of this dried paint, it just actually starts to scrub that paint off. So this is where I'll probably end up having to do a little bit of touch-ups on a future layer. Um, although again. It depends on, on what you want. I might decide to make these br bricks look a little bit more quote-unquote realistic. So, let me think about it. We'll, we'll think about it as we get into the painting on his body here. So, because the other thing too with bricks is usually they all look a little bit different. You know, you could put graffiti on some of these bricks if you wanted. Um, okay. <laughs> um. So, that's good for the for the background. Well, now let's take a look at the foreground. Think about these colors. Really what we have here is a it looks like the warm red and pretty darn close to the cool blue right out of the tube. Both of these colors are, are, are pretty strong, intense colors. The only thing I would say is maybe this cool blue has a little bit of warm blue in it and maybe a bit of white. So we might we we'll probably have to do a little a couple coats of uh, blue. In fact, this is what I'm going to suggest we do here for the blue on his outfit. Let's move right to that. I'm going to put some white down. We're not going to use too much of it. That clean. Actually, I'm probably going to have to move to a smaller brush. So, I'm going to take this white. Um, let's get some of the cool blue here. We'll put the, the, the panels side by side so you can see. So there's my cool blue. I'm going to take a bit of warm blue as well. Let's 
just going to make it a bit darker. And then I'm just going to take some white and mix it in here. The white is going to brighten it up for sure. Um, or it's going to tint it, and by tinting it, it's going to lose some of its intensity. It's going to appear lighter, but it's less of an intense color. I'm going to take some more white in here. This is so that when, if I paint the cool blue again over top of it, I'll get a really nice effect. Okay. So, uh, let's, let's, I think it's time to zoom in a little bit here on Spidey. And let's start here on his leg. Now we're going to outline everything with black later on. So that means where the, the background, that brick wall, meets up with his body. Uh, we don't... Uh, the, those that edge can be kind of rough because we're going to um, put a black line kind of right over top of it which will kind of hide any kind of the the messiness between that's oh, right you can see we're painting over top of the lines that I traced um, from the background that are over top of his body, they just disappear right away. My goal here again is not for perfection, really at any stage in the painting. Oh my goodness, I got a big blob of water from my overhead camera. I got an ice pack up there, so. Fix that. And just for one second. Man, we're we're just getting started here in this ice pack, which is this frozen solid is already getting uh So let's move on to this side. Now there's this area in the original you could see is just a big black shape All right so we can make a decision when we get there do we want to just make his shadow a solid black like it is in the comic book or do we want to we could do a glaze in there or paint a different color in there there's lots of different options here now you can also see that there's gonna be a line that's gonna go here that's gonna divide uh, the back of his uh, thigh and calf, right? But don't worry about that. We'll cover all that when we get there. Now let's uh, let's do his back here. Same sort of thing. Now there's the kind of where his back is. We're going to lose a little bit of that, and I'm actually just going to paint over part of that spider, because it's going to be, it can just drive me absolutely crazy trying to do all that, so I'll show you just how I fix some of this here. So I'm going to do a little bit of, as best as I can, some of those small little legs, especially in the background. I'll just paint over them. We'll paint some white over top of that shortly. And clean all that up. That way we'll have kind of a nice, clean, sharp logo on the on his back as opposed to something where we 
fiddle. Not, nothing, not that there's anything wrong with the fiddle. I love fiddle and fiddle music, but I don't want to be doing too much fiddling with my paintbrush, right? Because the paintbrush was not really made for fiddling, it was made for painting. Um, sorry, I, I have to fit in a, a certain amount of dad jokes every episode, otherwise um, I, uh, I lose my, my membership to the father... Uh, Hood Society, so um, it's just the price. Oops, okay, so look here. Me not paying attention. Th this is good because I'll show you how we fix all of this, just like when we do the the uh, the logo on his back. So, where did that line go? And you see I'm not, not upset at myself. It's just a bit, this is just typical part of the painting process sometimes if you're not fully paying attention you'll make a little bit of mistakes and even if you are paying a hundred percent attention you're gonna make some mistakes and what is a mistake but an opportunity right that's you you got your happy accident like Bob Ross used to say So maybe this, if you make a mistake like that, it's your first opportunity to learn how to do a quick little correction with your paint, right? One of the great things with acrylic paint is if you make a quote unquote mistake, it's really easy to, to fix it. So acrylic paint for the most part is I, I gotta say, probably the most forgiving of any of the painting mediums. You know, it's it's more forgiving than um, watercolor. I think watercolor is the least forgiving. And the irony is often people begin, they learn to paint with watercolor. And I I I bet you a lot of people stop painting because they think painting is so difficult. Because watercolor, I think watercolor is the most difficult method of painting that, that has ever been invented. Some people are great at it. Turner, uh, J.M.W. Turner, the British artist from the Romantic period, 1800s, was, I think, the best watercolorist of all. Um, but he made it look really easy. Deceptively easy. Okay, let's go down follow Spidey down the wall here because with watercolor you just you're adding paint constantly and if once it's you've got the paint on there it's really hard you have to kind of just basically integrate the paint that's there into the painting you it's you can I guess paint a little bit of acrylic over top of it to to cover up mistakes but usually that just makes things look worse because you can it now brings a lot of attention to itself okay so you know I look at that and I think actually that this blue that we've got here is pretty darn close to the actual blue in the in the comic now it might look a little bit different now because there's all of this red on here as well as the black outlines but you know, if we put them side by side, let's see where the legs meet, meet up. That's actually pretty good. I was my, my instinct was to actually mix the same paint without any white in it and paint it there. But now side by side, it looks like I could actually have used even more white. So that's a, a great, even just a small little little um, learning experience right there. Right, is that paint on your palette? Is going to look different than the paint on your canvas and not only that it's going to look different once the paint dries because paint will behave once that water evaporates in there the paint is going to look a little bit different again so and all of that just takes time um, to to learn and you you can tell people all this stuff ad nauseum it's not until they actually do it like 
I mean, every time I teach a, a painting class in person, we start at the beginning. Remember, there's a whole 45 episode intro to painting class. There's a link in the description below. It's all free. I see people joining and painting along every day to it, new people. And the, um, but if, when I do it in person, those exact same lessons, I hear a lot of like, oh, whoa, uh oh, like, because I think people have an idea like, oh yeah, this is really easy. It's just like, I'm going to mix this and that, and, and then I'm going to get this. And then they're like, whoa, oh my goodness. Okay. That did, I did not expect that it happened faster. Than, right. So, um, because it's one thing to watch me do all this stuff. It's a whole other thing to do it yourself. Okay. So I'm just looking at this right now and thinking, um, what should I do next? My instinct is to put another coat of blue over top of this. Um, so I'm just debating, should I go to the red right now and paint the red in? Let's, um, I have a feeling, again, just like the blue, if I paint the, um, the red just like that, it's going to be too dark. In fact, let's just, just so you can see, where should we do this? Um, well... I was gonna say, oops, you can't even see what I'm doing here. I thought that was gonna be too dark and we're gonna need to put a lot more of white in it, but hey, you know, let's, I think, well, let's just do this. Let's bring these two side by side. Until you do it, you never know. I, you know, I, I hmm, I do think we're gonna need a little bit of white because when that dries, it's gonna get dark. So I'm gonna take a bit of white out of here it's going to go a little bit pink, but I'm going to put another coat of red on there. The thing is, is we're going to lose a little bit of those, uh, the lines. This, by adding white in it, it's going to cover up some of those lines. If that's really terrifying you, then just leave the white out and just paint the red as it was. There's definitely in my mind, you know, providing the, the outlines is a kind of a double-edged sword in the sense that um, you know some people you know they really they love it because it certainly helps them um, but the only thing is sometimes people get overly reliant on on the lines and like oh I don't want to cover up the lines oh no now I'm lost and so I think a bit of uh, you should you know, you don't want to get too reliant on the the these lines to help you with your painting. You want to use them. Um, certainly, it helps. But imagine, you know, if you're painting a painting uh, on your own, you may or may not have any guidelines at all, right? One of the things that I love about, uh, that I think Steve Ditko is is largely responsible for, is when it comes to Spider-Man, is this, particularly like in his hands, and the crouching quality that he assumes, I think is right out of Steve Ditko's imagination. And you could say, well, it's pretty obvious that Spider-Man, if he was a spider, he would behave the way that he would, that he would kind of crawl along like this. But just look at the, like in this image, the way that the fingers kind of look like suction cups. 
and the way that they're really spread out as you know like fully extended fingers you will see later on other artists who uh, who went on to to also illustrate spider-man including um, uh, well pr most famously Todd McFarlane um, really um, took some of the these ideas that Steve Ditko established here and like really amped it up to the, to the next levels but one of these days we'll do an episode on Todd McFarlane it's a little piece of trivia is that him and I went to the same high school together he was he's a, a generation older than me um, but I remember when I was a kid knowing that that Todd McFarlane walked in the same building as I did and went to the same English room and all that kind of stuff and science room I was just like wow anyone I could be an artist anyone could be an artist there was an artist famous comic book artist was in this in this room I could do it and that's why I think you know the importance of having good role models is and being able to connect to other people that you see in the broader world is really important particularly for kids but even for adults too heaven knows we can all use uh, some inspiration in our lives right never never too old to to get inspired that's another reason why I love reading biographies or uh, autobiographies I think are even better even though I'm like I ha remember I had a, a teacher in graduate school who would who always said that autobiographies are the the worst source of information to, <laughs> to go to because it's people just trying to skew the record into their favor they're the least objective possible and often their memories are the worst <laughs> but uh, I do think there is um, it can be really um, helpful to just to, to, to even just understand the way the, the cadence of the way that somebody speaks etc and in that or writes I guess in that case okay so let's see the the symbol on Spider-Man's back. Uh, I guess before I do that, I, I think what I'm going to do is do another coat of the blue and just really firmly establish that, and then we'll come back. Um, so let's maybe zoom out just a little bit here. Same thing. <laughs> wow, there's so many people in the chat there. That's so cool. It makes me so excited to have such a diverse group of people painting and people who painted you know, Van Gogh just the other day, who are now painting Spider-Man today. Obviously a very different approach to a painting, but... You know, it's in in some you know some ways it's not all that different. You know, especially if you think of Van Gogh's the the, the his love for really bright saturated colors. You know, Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh was um, a huge fan of Japanese woodblock prints, which. Um, feature generally fairly saturated colors and often were outlined in black um, and he he was he really found that so inspiring that he incorporated some of that bright color outlining effects in his own paintings so It's super interesting. That's it, it's. I love how we can be inspired by people from other places on Earth and other cultures. Um, 
or other periods of time. Right, I think I think we 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 need to really, um, especially these days where people are so divided. The more that we can celebrate um, our what makes us unique as well as our similarities. Right, I think you know. One of these days, you know, hopefully during my lifetime, people will just realize, like, you know what? We are, like, on this tiny little rock flying around through space, just like, you know, a bunch of people on a, on a small boat in the middle of the ocean. And we all got to get along because there's much bigger problems than the disagreements we have between each other but anyway okay it's almost done all of my blue I think you know it's always a good idea just to take a, a second look at your image and just to like make sure that there's not like a we're missing some glaring problem here like potentially you know I didn't there, let's say his feet were blue or something so you know there, I can't tell you how many times I've been working on a painting and gotten pretty far and then it, I'm like whoa how on earth did I miss? There's times where in these classes I, I finish the, the the class and I go and I hang the painting up upstairs in our living room and settle down for the night and I'm like and I sit back and look at it and go, oh my goodness, whoa, how like that's wild. How did I miss that? Some glaring issue. Okay, so. Oops, got a little bit of blue down there. Let's see if we can just clean that up. Or do I have to go back into that background and fix that? So here's a little bit of water. Got to be quick and also not rub too much. Otherwise, I'm going to start literally rubbing paint off of that surface. Okay. So that's pretty good. Again, I'm going to darken this um, I'm just going to paint warm red right out of the tube over top of this kind of pinky color because I'm sure some people are like wow look at that guy What is, he doesn't know what he's doing uh, so I'm going to I just want to wait for this to dry a little bit and I think I can also do the symbol on his back now so let's, I'm actually going to take a bit more white, so make this even more intensely white. Okay, I'm going to mix that up and then I'm going to paint it with a smaller brush. So let's go down to a little more of a detailed brush. And let's see. Actually, you know what? I'm going to blow dry this really quickly. That way I don't get blue on my red brush. So I'll just mute the microphone for a second. Okay, so now let's paint the the symbol on Spider-Man's back. So let's zoom right in there. So everyone's talking about the uh, the wildfires and the smoke going across um, North America. It's pretty intense. My goodness. 
Our skies here in the Vancouver area are a bit reddish today. Not not super bad. A few years ago it was incredible. We had uh, you know air quality warnings, etc. So not as bad as it once was a few years ago, but uh, uh, it does have a bit of like a kind of it almost looks a little bit like the evening is already here. I know that uh, in Alberta, where my folks live, it's been pretty bad. I see some mention of that in the chat. I haven't had a chance to really look too carefully. So, these legs oops, look a little bit funky. other legs in the back So that's much easier than fiddling around with uh, the uh, the blue going in and around this, then doing it with the the red and back and back and forth and so forth. Okay, so just doing a little bit of touch-ups here. Actually, I'm just gonna. a few places where the paint didn't quite get into all the nooks and crannies. So, oops, sorry. Let's just... Let's zoom back out. All I'm doing is just going over top of some of those details. Little places that I could see some of the yellow from that very first layer coming through, so I just wanted to cover that up. Okay, that feels really good. I think uh, I do want to do a little bit more on that background again. And another little pass with color on there I don't think will hurt. I think it'll just make it a little bit better. So maybe before that, I'm just going to clean a few brushes off here. I, I, again, I say this all the time, but I imagine there's people who tune in and look at, at the painting at this stage and are like, wow, that's awful. It doesn't look anywhere near like this. Can you believe this guy's trying to teach people how to paint? What garbage. What a fraud. <laughs> I could just be my own thought, but I, I you know, because I, I can see the numbers going up and down, up and down. People tuning in, tuning out, so, you know, maybe people are like, ah, I'm just going to check back in another hour and see where he's at. But it's always important just to remember, this is a stage in the painting process. Right? And of course it's going to look like garbage at different times. Just as there might be stages in the painting where you go like, wow, this is even, this is better than I imagined. I, maybe I should just stop right now. And hey, if you, if you feel that way about your painting, you're just like, I don't know. I, I know there's another five steps to go, but I kind of like it like this then you can you can just stop like there you don't have to continue uh, there's no there's no obligation on you as a human being or as an artist to 
finish the painting to whatever predetermined standards that somebody else might have for their painting. Just as, you know, uh, you know, because I'm going to put black lines over top of it, I could see some people being like, you know, I, I don't know if it needs black lines. Maybe, maybe I'm going to put purple lines or green lines there, or or no lines at all. So, anyway, I, for some people that sounds really obvious, and then for a lot of other people that's like, oh, I didn't, I never really thought about that. I I could do that. So let's do the background again. The, the, the one thing with this background is you can see how transparent it is. Now, my only fear is if I add some white in there to try to make it a little bit more uh, opaque, that I'm going to lose a bunch of the pencil lines in there. So... Hmm. 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 I, you know, I don't now. As I look at it, I think to myself, I don't know. I just, I don't know if I could, it could be, it could be okay like this. Maybe I'll just take a little bit of leftover paint that I have and just do a quick little. Okay, I, I got an idea. Rather than just painting the whole thing and doing a quick another layer. I'm going to mix this color again, but this time uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to paint it over everything. We're going to, it's almost like we're going to glaze a little bit here. So let's take a bit of, oops, a little too much of that blue. Uh, now this could be just a, a slow, this could slow down my process a lot, but I'm just going to sort of paint in individual bricks a little bit. That way I might have some slightly different discolored bricks, which I think could be kind of cool. We'll see. You, you know, again, you don't really know if it's going to look cool or not until it's done. But then once it's done, then you can decide, ah, you know what, that turned out. You know, I'm going to do a little bit more of this or that effect in the painting. So it's like I'm just sort of... Uh, I'm paint that brick. Right around these fingers, I think you need a little bit more. This might be something I come back to at the very end and give a little bit more nuance to some of these different bricks. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, we want to think about, like, we are making a painting, right? So how can we take advantage like what what does the painting allow us to do that you know doing this on the computer might otherwise not allow us to do right like so part of painting is we are going to get a little bit more variation um, and so rather than trying to kind of hide that we can embrace it and accentuate it I think a lot of people want to often hide the, the handmade quality of a painting, which always just strikes me as a little bit odd. So... You know, it's like... Uh, it's like the thing that makes the whole ask painting process fun is like some people want to uh, get rid of that entirely so which is always a bit of a mystery to me so 
maybe as I do this, I just get a bit more blue on. It's uh, a little bit too much. This is definitely kind of a little bit more on the noodly, fiddly aspect of things, but I guess I just had a yearning for a little fiddle. Quick little fiddle session. We'll see. You know, if you're watching this later, you just like zip to the end and you can decide like, eh, what that thing that he was doing at the hour and a half mark, eh, I don't know about that. That was kind of I'm not gonna do that. Or you go, wow, that actually turned out really great. I, I, I'm gonna do a little bit more of that. What will people in the future say? So that's that drives me a little bit nuts. That kind of stuff here. Because that paint is not quite dry, and I tried to paint into it. Okay, I think I think I'll just move on from this here in a second. It's just a way of just sort of cleaning up some of these edges and giving a little bit. Of, I can see that I, I'm I'm quite confident this is actually going to look cool, but uh, so I'm just going to embrace it and do it. But and it might be a little bit hard to see on camera that happening just because it's some of these lines have disappeared a bit but okay anyway we can add more to this later on so What should we do next? I think um, at this point, maybe let's do the red on his, we'll go back over top of all of that red. So, I'm just gonna take the red, warm red right out of the tube and then let's just paint this all over. I've, usually red is a fairly transparent color. So I would imagine we're going to see most of the lines underneath. This is That's one of the reasons why I added the white into that previous layer. But I think, you know, I don't, it looks like so intensely vibrant on camera that all of a sudden that looks like a, just a big solid shape, but I can still see the lines underneath there, so even though it kind of behaves a little bit different on camera it's looking pretty good in person You're probably saying like, "What about the the his eyes and stuff? That's totally gone." 
You've made a huge mistake, Michael. Ah ha ha. Ah ha ha. We are. We're not there yet. We're not done yet. We're still, still working here, folks. So as I go here, I'm just because that's going to be. I'm going to put some white, and we're going to black outline all that. So. So at this point, we're almost done. What I would say is like our underpainting. Um, you know, really, we're we're pretty close just to going after this right into to black outlines. Um, uh, we're, obviously, I'll put some white in between the bricks. I think that's what we'll do after this red. But the majority of the rest of today's episode is just going to be doing some outlining. Because now we've got all of the, the color really on the canvas. Oh, it's interesting how it just looks like a big solid shapes on camera. Um, just how red that red is like sort of tricking the the sensors in the camera. Okay, what should we do? Pull the sleeve up a little bit. Let's get this other foot. You know, one of the interesting things about Spider-Man is, and I don't know all of the details of it, it's just, just you know, my observations, is uh, unlike the rest of the Marvel Universe, Spider-Man, the rights to Spider-Man's film and television uh, license were sold separately to, well, now they're owned by Sony, so what's interesting is Spider-Man has only very recently been um, shown as part of the film Marvel, you know, what do they call it, the Marvel MCU, Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, because of, uh, like, disputes with, like, rights. So um, previous to that, Sony was releasing Spider-Man movies as opposed to... Marvel, which is owned by Disney, releasing Marvel movies. So it is, you know, even just the fact that Spider-Man has been in some of the more recent Marvel movies is actually kind of a big deal because that's, you're talking like huge media conglomerates making a decision to, to like collaborate together, which they don't have to, really just for the sake of well, I was going to say just for the sake of fans, but really it's because they're just like, well, we could probably make a couple extra billion here if we put our differences aside. And <laughs> um, But it's one of those little quirks that back in the 60s, Spider-Man's rights were sold independently of the rest of the Marvel Universe. Which would technically make it possible for Sony to make a Superman and Spider-Man movie. Um, whereas it's very unlikely you would ever see a um, Incredible Hulk and Batman movie because they're two totally different companies. Having said that, I remember when I was a kid, there was a series of comic books. Was it the What If series? Where they did do crossovers, where it would be like Batman and Spider-Man in the same universe. And it was like, whoa, that's the coolest thing. These two companies putting aside their differences to make a cool comic book together. 
I wonder how they how they uh, split the money on that because you I'm sure you could there's there's some executives well even though this is a spider-man and Batman comic people are really buying it because of Batman you know spider-man's a secondary character and just go on and on until like do they split 50 50 or One of these days we'll see that in movies, and I'm positive. It'll just take a little while. But once the dollar signs start, uh, they see the dollar signs, they'll, they'll, they'll come to their senses. Okay. So the other thing, too, to realize at this point is things kind of look a little bit choppy and sloppy. Um, because... The whole po our goal here is to get it to the point where we can do the outlining, and when we put black outlines over top of anything, it instantly cleans it all up and gives it structure, right? So as you can and you can do this by just painting something very loosely, uh, like in watercolor, for instance. Like watercolor is actually a great example because you can you know, you often people draw with a pencil and then apply it kind of like washes and, and even splatters of watercolor and then they let it dry and then take like a black pen or um, um, you know black ink on a brush and just kind of do a little bit of outlining even when you know colors are, are uh, you know aren't in the lines and then you put the line over top all of a sudden it just poof, the image pops back together it's one of the, the the amazing things that that doing that line work has over top of an image. Okay, so that's still kind of wet. I could blow dry this in a second. Just trying to get rid of any little peaks because when I do all these outlining, all that extra texture is just going to make it a little bit harder for me to um, to brush. Didn't I say there was an area here? Or maybe that was on the brown. That's fine. Okay, so I think the next step that I'm going to do, and again, this is not in the original, because I'm sure some people are like, um, hmm, I don't know if he knows that this is yellow and he's painted his background brown. Uh, he obviously uh, has some eyesight problems. <laughs> um, so... What I, I think I want to do, if we go back to, to my version, is I want to paint some, you know, the the uh, the mortar in between all of these bricks. And usually it's going to be white, right? We probably aren't not going to paint it bright white. We're gonna we'll mix kind of a, a more subdued uh, grayish white, I imagine, almost maybe the same color as this brown, but with a little bit of extra. In fact, maybe. Maybe it's just, it's always a good idea to do a quick little um, search here. So let's just do brick wall and take a look. All right, so this is kind of the effect that I'm going for here. You can see we've got some darker bricks. In fact, I'm going to drag that off. I'm going to bring it into our here. So we can kind of use this as a bit of a uh, template, right? So this color, we're going to paint in this kind of dirty white kind of in there. And again, we're going to do that with some colder colors to push that color backwards, especially when we get a little bit higher up into the image, because you want to be thinking about with this image that, you know, let's say... Uh, this is a building spider-man would be this is the the bottom down here is the ground and the higher up here we go is literally going up into the clouds as I'm looking at this I didn't put any windows on here so you could put windows on there but that might just be it. well we'll see so let's just like a lot of things we'll see <laughs> uh, I'm gonna use a bunch more white so let's put some more on the palette we need more of any other color here. I think we're okay. Um, I'm going to keep this separate. This is my cool yellow and cool blue, so maybe I'll mix it into this 
uh, let's say quadrant, but what's a uh, quadrant is if we have four spaces, what's a, a quin quindrant? What, what's, a, what's the, if you have five spaces, I don't know what that is. Um, okay, so let's mix that color again. Take some cool blue. It's a lot. I'm not sure why I put so much on there. Um, maybe should we make it a purpley? In fact, let's take a second just to take a look. Really, what we're looking at here is mostly just gray, right? So maybe we'll just mix a gray and we'll just kind of show you how to get a gray. So we'll take this color here, this purple. Let's add a bit of the cool yellow to it. And then I'm going to add a bit of warm red to the same color. Adding, so basically all of these colors, we've, we've made this color that is residing in the kind of bluey purpley area and by going all the way across the color wheel it just basically just kills the color and turns it into a dark dark color so that we can actually even use this color for outlining in lieu of black if you didn't have any black um, but I'm going to take some white now and mix here so now here we've got a cold gray color really nice beautiful gray a little bit on the slightly purpley side but I like that now that well actually that might be fine I was gonna say it might be a little bit dark but I think it might be better to go a little bit lighter and then darken it with some shadow so we'll see so let me just take a bit more white put this here and I think as we paint I'll be sort of just dipping in adding more or less white just to give lots of variation and variety here. Okay. So since we don't have that image, maybe we'll just keep this up on the screen for the next few minutes while we're doing this next step here. Um, so, I'm gonna start with maybe a larger brush. And I'm gonna start kind of towards the bottom of the painting. That way, because it's, it's what's most likely to happen when we start doing some outline is it's gonna be a little bit sloppy, right? Until we sort of just get into the um, the hang of it, get, you know, it's, it's like a muscle, it needs to be stretched a little bit. So whenever I'm doing outlining, you can even literally take another piece of paper. Like you could take this, and you could just try to practice drawing a few lines. Like you could go, okay, I'm gonna just trace over this line and just try to practice that. Um, but I also suggest if you're gonna do that, like what is the widest possible line so that if I make a mistake, then that's gonna be fine. I, probably some of the area up here is gonna be much finer lines. I may even use a palette knife to help me get some of that. So down here where I can be a little bit looser that's where i'm going to do my initial set of lines so let's go down to the bottom i think what i'm going to do also to start is just do all my horizontal lines and i'll do that all the way across and then i'll, I'll do the divisions uh, between the bricks okay and in fact i might uh well i'll, I'll um I'll start kind of halfway up here, just because it's be a little hard for me to reach over some of this. And I'm not going to be too concerned about keeping my hand totally steady. If anything, I'm going to allow it to get a little, a little wobble in there. Otherwise, it might look a little bit too stiff and boring. Um, I want it to kind of have a little bit of the the look of actual brickwork, right? Which is, has a lot of texture. So 
some areas are going to be thin and you and you'll you won't be able to see much of the the brick or the the mortar and then some other areas will be kind of a little bit wider So obviously, as these bricks go further up the the wall, they're getting closer. They appear to be getting closer together, or the, they're smaller, right? Which gives us the illusion of depth. If they were all the exact same size and shape, then that would be a little bit confusing because it would look like we're looking at the wall straight on. So if you if you're just sketching this out on your own, you want to just be a little bit mindful of that, right? And again, I know this sounds probably really like duh obvious to some people, and then for some other people, it's like, oh yeah, I didn't even didn't even occur to me. Because not everything is is obvious to everyone. I did, it just reminds me, uh, I did a, I was filming a podcast, uh, was it a year, right before the pandemic hit, and obviously it's been delayed, um, I, w I was interviewing scientists and artists about, about the, the challenges involved in making art in space. Because if you, as you may know, if you've ever gone to my website and looked at it, or you've watched any of the the press that I've done and television interviews, etc., you've seen that I have a particular interest in space travel and going to the moon myself. Um, and It, it was so interesting talking to like all these astrobiologists and astrophysicists, astronomers, etc. Um, and just asking them all, the, all these kind of random questions and realizing how many weird assumptions that I have. Like, I don't know, like, I could just, I could talk, it's a discussion for another episode, but how many things that I thought were 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 just truisms and then just learning from them they're like that's not true at all like where did you hear like oh or that these are just there's so many myths and things so things that for them are just like so obvious that for me were were kind of like earth shattering so when you come at it from a totally different perspective you may not may not know that history all the way zoomed out you can't even see what I'm doing um, okay so maybe I'm gonna rotate this canvas here so my lines are all fairly the same size I think that's just the way that I'm gonna I, I'm gonna start it and if I want I'm gonna I'll probably go back and widen the ones at uh, the, the bottom of the canvas. The other thing I would say is when you're doing this type of thing is it, it's pro it's I strongly encourage just to go all the way across. You might be tempted just to do a whole bunch of lines in a row, but what ends up happening, especially if you're going behind a figure or a bowl of fruit or whatever it is, is that you may find that those lines don't match up after you've done a ton, and then you're like, oh, 
I'm really committed because I've already done all these lines. And there are examples of artists who who did that purposefully. Like Paul Cezanne would be the probably the most famous, who then inspired both Picasso and Matisse, who incorporated that sort of technique of deliberately playing with um, uh, it's ultimately playing with perspective but it's definitely a little bit more of an advanced um, process it's almost like you gotta kind of know some of these rules before you break them otherwise you get lost you know, so some of these areas are probably gonna get very dark there's gonna be shadows underneath uh, by his thighs and So this gives you an idea, like if some of these areas on the top of the wall get really thick, then that might mean the ones further down at the bottom are going to have to get much thicker. So as I'm starting to get further up the wall, these lines should be getting thinner, but they can also get uh, less like opaque and almost like we start getting into a bit of a dry brush. So whereas earlier on at the top, I might go over the line a few times, here if it gets a little bit dry and kind of just peters out in fact let's just start to zo we'll zoom in a bit here i'm just gonna embrace it just let it do that and i'm not going to go back over those lines hmm not sure what i'm doing here these bricks are getting a little bit strange and crooked there. See, now when he's up like this, doesn't it feel like he's upside down sticking to like a ceiling or something and part of that is the way that by putting these bricks here like that that really gives it a sense of depth I notice in the Facebook group, I see people working on some of the older paintings. You don't have to do every single one of these paintings, by the way. I know um, it looks like some of you are absolutely determined to do every single one of them, which makes me really happy because obviously I care about all of these and they have different, they're important to me for various different reasons. 
But I understand, like, if you just want to be like, yeah, I don't know, there's some that appeal to me and some that don't, and I'm just gonna... You know, just do less and less. Or do just do the ones that appeal to you and... and uh, but, you know, I also I try to kind of touch different styles and and continue to kind of build on some of the skills that we have so it's not just random images i spent so long trying to choose the right ones for each class and which order they go in as my wife can attest to is sitting there on the laptop late at night into the mornings just like okay which should we do next Okay, so as I'm getting closer and closer here, it does. There's a few things that come to mind. It is possible I could paint this like white and then put like a sky there. I could paint like a big area of blue here, so it looks like that's the top of the building. I could see that being really cool. Um, I think. I think. Let me just, what I want to do, I'm going to do a little bit of a dry brush. So I just took the paint, got more paint on my brush. I just sort of lightly wipe it off onto a rag. This way as we go up here, it's just getting... Thinner and thinner and thinner. You can also just wipe it on the edge of your palette. And then as I go here, I'm just going to stop kind of going all the way across and just do little pops. Okay, so let's just take a look at this here. And it'll look a little bit different from this angle too, so... That's cool. I think it'll also really benefit by darkening some of these, but we'll do that with the bricks as we go. Um, so I think before I start widening anything, let's do the, the diagonal bricks that are going up here you I think maybe even it would benefit us just to blow dry this really quickly so that um, we don't smudge on here so I'm just gonna wash this brush really quickly Always good to keep those brushes as clean as possible. Okay, so let's get the hair dryer out. And we'll just mute the microphone for just a second.
Okay. So, um, Donna says, that's awesome, Michael. <laughs> So this is, I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Donna. Um, I, th I think, I mean, I, I, that it does create a really nice effect of the of things sort of disappearing. It almost looks like ripples on water or something. I think some people might say it looks good, but there's some kind of weird, like he's flying or floating over it, or he doesn't really feel like he. They're, they feel like they're two different shapes. There's the Spider-Man, and then we got this detailed background, but they, they're not meshing together. So a couple of reasons why that's happening is obviously there's we have this the background's got a lot more variation in the paint, whereas right now we got these very solid colors on Spider-Man. The other probably the main reason why it. It, it's obviously when we put the outlines on it's going to change but I would say it's the shadow the, the lack of the shadow uh, is causing a bit of confusion right even if we do all of the outlines on there but we don't do the shadow it's still gonna seem like we've got a spider-man that we cut out of paper and collaged onto a background how we bridge those together is with the shadow shadows are really one of the most important parts of any painting because um do i have that book around here somewhere i have a great book on shadows like the kind of the history of shadows which i know sounds kind of bizarre i love those kind of books about really something very specific but i think it's i think it's just called shadows or something. I don't know, anyway but um it's it blew my mind to think about how important shadows are in every aspect of our lives and um, shadows in paintings tell us really the relationship between the object or the person to the surrounding environment, right? So the, the, the size and the distance that the shadows have from the body will tell us how close he is to the wall or if he's flying or floating off of it, etc. So those shadows are going to suction his body right onto this wall. And it will change the painting quite dramatically once we get that on there. So, uh, let's now, we're going to do our diagonal lines going up, or the vertical lines. Now, one thing, and I just I want to stress this immediately, is let's take a look at at the, the uh, outline that I did again, quickly. Because notice that, we, like, let's say this first one right down the middle. That one is going st almost straight up and down, perpendicular to the page, you know, to the bottom of the page. Every other line is a diagonal. And all of these diagonal lines, so there's one line going straight up down the middle, perhaps. But everything else is going on angles. And they're going increasingly outward towards a, like a, a vanishing point which that vanishing point would be way up here somewhere ideal like you know at the top of the building or or wherever but if you decide if you just paint all of these lines all vertical and they're all parallel to the edge of the page again it's going to look a little bit strange and you may not even understand why and I, I won't be surprised if I see some people do that themselves and I won't be angry or upset or um, I think it's just one of those things that I, I know having taught perspective for 20 years that this type of thing is a bit of a mind uh, corkscrew for some people so just you know you may even want if if you may even just want to watch for the next five minutes as i do a little bit of this just so that and again you have the template here but i i i know that some people are really going to struggle with getting some of the making sure these lines are not entirely vertical but that they are also diagonal and that they're receding towards a, a hidden vanishing point Okay, so um, where should we start? Usually I like to work on the left sides because I'm right-handed, so I, I, I don't smudge over those areas. So let's let's pick... Um, 
maybe some place where we can begin because I'm telling you it's so much easier if you find a beginning spot and then work from here so even let's say this knee I'm gonna let's begin right around here now there is this shadow this is gonna be a dark shadow here so don't get confused with this line I'm gonna start right here I'm just gonna leave the the uh, cursor on the screen there so I'm gonna pull up my sleeve Right, you see how that's not straight up and down, it's on a diagonal, right? And we can even, you know what, it may even be easier, f let's just take a pencil and draw this out. Just because it might be easier for some people if they see. So I'm also going to skip over every second brick. Right, as will become apparent shortly here. So let's paint this. And I'm like I said with the lines, this may be even more so than anything. Is to do is to start somewhere and then expand outward from it. Otherwise, you run the risk of creating like a one area where they don't all match up and I'll tell you when I did this when I was doing this illustration I I had a few of those things where all of a sudden things just were not lining up properly there was kind of a big area of confusion like ah I had to kind of start the whole background over again that background took me about 45 minutes to draw on the computer it was just a kind of a very frustrating so again let's now look for another area here right so we don't we want this brick to be opposite All right so here we've got another one right here this is what I'm I just did that line there And then let's, uh, we've got another one right here by the fingertip. Okay. And I'm going to keep building outwards with what I know and what is working before I just start getting all silly here, right? So take your time. I know there's going to be some people who just think this is super easy. It makes this. I'm telling you, when you get up into this area of the body, it's here. It's it is gets a little bit confusing. All right, so we just skip this brick and go right up here. And I might even just do these. I'm going to do these, just like I did these ones here, do them nice and thin. And that way, later on, I can make some adjustments. Because they might, like even this one I notice is a little bit tilted. This So I want to kind of bring it back that way. So, But, but let's just finish as we go here. So let's maybe do... Got these ones... I mean, the easiest way is you just take like a ruler and you could draw that line all the way back down. But um, in fact, since I just mentioned it, let's just do it. All right, we'll take a ruler and then you can go try to find here. Mm 
It's, some people are probably like, well, I thought we were going to be painting Spider-Man, and here we are learning how to paint bricks. This is crazy. <laughs> I th I'm pretty confident that by the end, this is going to look really cool. So... Maybe we'll just do a few more of those while we're here. Ah. I could also, um, let's see, we're gonna go right here next. In fact, you know what, I'm gonna speed this up and do these really kind of lightly. And then if I want to touch them up, I'll do that. Or I will touch them up, but just sort of just to get them onto the surface here. Okay. Oops, you see that one should, gonna be, should be more diagonal. So, where's the next? So there's, because there's uh, no bricks on this side, let me see. Um, This takes a bit of mental, you gotta be kind of focused when you're doing this kind of thing because as I said, like when I was doing these original, uh, did the outlines, I got a little overconfident, I'm doing all this and I came back over here and then they didn't match at the in the middle and I'm like, oh. So it's like the bricklayer kind of um, goofed up, right? And there's some kind of weird pattern that bricklayer gets fired because they're just not paying attention. So as we go back up in further and further into this area, some of these 
So let's actually let's zoom in to up here. So now when we get up into here, we'll just let things kind of get a little bit fuzzy or blurry or actually that wasn't the best move. That should have they should have been going. But we can kind of tidy this stuff up as we go, too. We can kind of blur it out. We can paint out any mis so called mistakes. And, you know, a brick wall might not always be super perfect either. There might be... Maybe there was a few problems along the way. and There was maybe a window that got bricked in, or who knows, right? So... Almost done this initial little bit here. I know it's a little bit time consuming, but it is absolutely well worth kind of just taking your time here to, to get it right. Otherwise, it can be really frustrating when, when it doesn't look right, right? Like some of these blobs, it kind of drives me a bit nuts. But. All right, so you can see where that is just a simple touch up that can be done. Now, let's look back at the painting. So what I want to do now, I'm just going to spend just a few minutes going over, taking the same paint that we had here. I'm just going to widen some of the mortar towards the bottom of the, the wall here. This paint's starting to kind of get thicker. So I'm not going to go all the way across again, just think about you want to start thinking about these as individual bricks as well. Not as lines, but each brick having its own kind of distinct shape. So when I'm painting them, rather than kind of going all the way across at this time, it's just kind of outlining individual bricks. You can see kind of like just giving some bricks a little bit extra shape. It's, you know, just looking back here, like you could see you know, even some of these are kind of a little bit funny looking smaller bricks.
Did I mention today is Spider-Man Day? I probably don't even think I mentioned that all. <laughs> like, why are we painting Spider-Man on this particular day? It's because it's Spider-Man Day. So, uh, I don't know why it's Spider-Man Day. I don't know if this is when the very first appearance of Spider-Man happened on this day back in 1962. Or this was the birthday of... of I, don't, I don't think this is the birth of Steve Ditko's birthday. You know, some of the we we can talk about Spider-Man himself as opposed to just Steve Ditko. That uh, you know, one of the things that makes Spider-Man, or, or at least made him very unique when he first appeared, is that Spider-Man was, uh, or even just let's think about what the other characters were that existed up until that particular point in time. The most famous comic book characters of the 1940s were Superman and Batman. And then you might have had a few others, um, but really those are the two biggest, most popular characters. And they were you would see them in um, film serials, not serial boxes, but some people may remember or know that early films were like 20 minutes long. And you would go to the movie theater rather than watching television because television wasn't around yet. And you would see, like, you know, once a week a new Batman serial. And usually they were famous for having the quote unquote cliffhanger endings where it looks like Spider Man falls off the building or off a cliff. And of course, you got to go back next week and pay another nickel to see what happened. But anyway, Superman was this like super human. He he had these powers that no one else had. He could do. He was basically invincible, and he was like a a fully grown man. Although he wasn't a human being, I I know. Um, but the the main difference with and Batman was the same thing. He was kind of like a bachelor, you know, in his. Wonder what, how how old he is in the comics? Probably in his thirties, I would say thirties. And you know, like a full-grown adult. Whereas Spider-Man was a guy who was in high school. He was like fifteen years old, and he's was bitten by a spider in a in a laboratory accident that was radioactive and all of a sudden he's got spider power spider sense and he had to kind of not only navigate the the pressures of now being having this sudden superpower and being able to um, save the world and all this kind of stuff but he also uh, had to go to school and at least originally and then he he actually in the comic one of the big things that Steve Ditko actually disagreed with Stan Lee about was Stan Lee wanted uh, Superman to graduate from high school and to go on to do other things, such as work at the Daily Bugle, where he became a photographer and was taking photographs, and that's how he met J. Jonah Jameson. Um, Steve Ditko, on the other hand, thought that Spider-Man should stay in school, and that was a big, important feature of his. Right? Uh, that could have been one of the reasons why Spider-Man left, uh, or Steve Ditko left uh, Marvel. The other big thing that not only did Spider-Man have to, let's zoom in on these eyes, not only did Spider-Man have to uh, navigate all these different pressures of school and life as a superhero, but a big foundational part of the Spider-Man myth and story is that um, after Peter Parker, who is the so-called real-life character underneath the mask, after he was bit by this spider, 
he decided to become a wrestler to, to make some quick, easy money. Because now he had this, like, super strength. So he's like, you know what? If I enter into all these, like, feats of strength contests, I'll beat up all these big guys because they won't think... They'll just think, see me as a scrawny teenager and I'll whoop their butts and make a bunch of money and I'll be rich. But what ends up happening, and I can't remember the... I'm sure somebody will remember... I used to be a huge Spider-Man fan. I've read every comic. I know the whole story. Uh, I just can't remember them offhand. But he... I think it's a, a one of these wrestling matches that he attends. There's a... Uh, I think he's maybe standing outside waiting to go in. Or it's a break in between the acts. The wrestling matches. And there's like a... a uh, I think it's like a bank robbery that happens... Uh, and he's, he's, he witnesses the, the criminal running away from the police and the, the criminal runs right by him uh, and Peter Parker later to become Spider-Man decides not to do anything he's like, it doesn't have anything to do with me I'm not going like, to get involved and the police run by and they're like, why didn't you s stop that guy? and he's like, ah, it's not my, my problem of course, later on it turns out that that guy who was running from the police escapes and kills Spider-Man or Peter Parker uh, he kills Peter Parker's uncle because he's living with his aunt and uncle at the time and uh, so all of a sudden and, and, and Peter Parker realizes this he, he sees the guy on the news bar being carted away by the police and realizes if I had only done something my uncle would still be alive these people that have raised me since I was a kid and of course, it causes this like, you know, um, uh, him to have this awakening where he realizes I have this superpower. I got to do something with it so that more people don't uh, die. And because his uncle's dead, he now has to become the breadwinner and support his aunt, who's um, this little old lady who you know is. Uh, I can't remember, she, she might be in a wheelchair, I think. So there's, like, all this drama. So now he has to get a job working at the newspaper. And I think that's how he meets J. Jonah Jameson. Anyway, it's just like, it's there's a really interesting story there. That, that A lot of that is uh, Stan Lee's genius to, to come up with all of those ideas. But um, certainly Steve Ditko was the one who, who pull, put it all together into these great... Um, visuals. Okay, so now, okay, we're doing pretty good on time because now we're basically going to focus on just doing the outlining on Spider-Man. Uh, there is, I, I, we could do a lot more work to these bricks. We we could add little shadows underneath and stuff here. I think I might do that as glazes though, when we do the shadow on on uh, Spider-Man himself. So, uh, I think I'm, are, are we ready to do that? Yeah, I'm just cleaning off these brushes. Okay, where did I got? got a little snack bar, because a little bit hungry here. Thank you for indulging me. Okay, so what I just did, I squeezed some black paint onto my palette. Now, this particular image is pretty straightforward. We don't really have, like the background is all with white outlines. And I'm not gonna paint any black outlines on there right now. If there were windows, you could paint them black I would also recommend mixing a little bit of cool brown maybe into that black just so it's we want the the traditionally in in regular quote unquote regular painting you really want to reserve any black especially black on its own 
for the foreground. We don't really want to be painting any black on its own in the background, otherwise it's going to pull something from the background and launch it right up to the front of the painting. Right? And that can be really confusing for the viewer. And generally, we don't want to confuse the viewer when they're looking at the art. So, the other thing, we could mix... I mean, I, I like this paint here, right? Or this cold, purpley color that we used to make the white for these bricks. We could use that. I'd probably want to mix a bit of a warmer version of it. But... Um, in fact, let's 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 mix the warmer version of it so you can see how the warmer version of that color is made, and then we can mix a little bit of that into this. So let's take some warm yellow and warm red, and we'll just mix this into a orange. And then let's mix some warm blue in here, and we'll get a nice warm brown. This is a little bit more on the bluish side, so it looks kind of quite like a muddy brown, like a like a greenish barf color or something, right? But that's you know there there are lots of uses for a color like this. You know, it looks kind of like mud, and I think a lot of people are like, oh, that's gross. Why would I ever use that? Well, because there's a lot of brown in the world around us, right? There's a lot of kind of dark, shadowy areas like that. Anyway, let's now take. I'm seeing what I have a lot of here. This cool yellow. Let's take some cool red and put that in there. Basically, mixing in some of the other cool colors is going to help kill any of the the intensity of that existing color. That's cool, this is like a little bit of a, a brown here. If I wanted to make this even darker, I would add a little bit more warm blue and cool blue in here. And it would go just the same sort of look as that. But I like that, it's good. Okay, so let's, um, actually let's, we'll do this right here. So let's take our black. We're not gonna need much of it. Black is just such an intense, overpowering color that we can just mix this into here and get a really nice dark color. The reason why I just, I very rarely just use black all by itself is I just find it's like such a strong color that it, it, it sits so far onto the foreground that sometimes it even just separates from the colors that it's supposed to be complementing. So I'm just going to take my brush, mix it into here. So I get a bit of the black and the brown on my brush. Now, obviously, you could just paint black right on there, and you probably won't notice much of a difference. But hey, I, I want to try to make this as good as possible. So I'm just telling you kind of how you might do that. <laughs> um, let's see. I think I'm going to start at the, the leg and just sort of work my way down here. That way I don't uh, smudge paint all over the surface of this picture. Okay. And I guess we can go in a little bit closer, right? Okay, I think what I'm going to start doing is I'm just going to outline some of the outer parts of, of the body and before I get too worked up into the webbing um, feature of his clothes. Because that in itself could be a little bit confusing, so... We want. We don't want to be too confused today. It's a beautiful, sunny Sunday, and so if you're sitting here painting with me instead of outside in the sun, you want it to have a relaxing time. You don't want to get all frustrated.
See how it just starts cleaning up the the mess. Oops, let's focus that a bit. So I'm just going to go around and do kind of the main lines before I, I get too too far into things, right? So, um, let's see. I think I'm going to add just a little bit of glazing fluid in here onto my palette. Just a little tiny bit. Just these, it's so hot in this room right now that this paint is getting sticky really quickly, especially because I'm painting kind of thinly with it. So the glazing fluid, you could use the slow dry medium or paint retarder. The only thing is, is it's going to make this paint a little bit more transparent. I think if you do it this way and you just go around the whole body before you get into all the little details, I think you will find this a little bit easier. Like now I can, s it's easier to now see the lines inside the foot where the web goes after I've got a little bit more of the construction of the body on here. So let's just keep on going. There's a lot of stuff I want to do on there, but I'm just going to get this sort of first pass completed, right? Outline the belt. This is not really a belt. Is, is this... It's funny, d different issues of Spider-Man, different artists have illustrated Spider-Man in different ways. And I have, I think I've seen some Spider-Mans where this area is, a, is like a utility belt versus some other illustrators this is just sort of like the the bottom of the shirt because usually he can it's like a he's got a pants and a shirt that he's the shirt comes off sometimes so um let's see So I'm just going to kind of do the legs and move on to the bottom part, like his torso here. Okay. And so I'm also looking for this shape. What is this shape down here? Kind of bulges a little bit out of there, which I think was just as I was painting it, I got a little bit out. So I'm just gonna see how like this there was kind of this wave shape, and I'm now I'm just smoothing it out. And I'm not going to, even that, though that line is kind of a little bit thick and thin, I'm just going to keep on going. Just keep on going. Just get the basics in place.
So there's a little bulge of paint out there again. I can use these lines just to kind of smooth everything out. I strongly recommend that you watch that documentary in search of Steve Ditko. I think it is really uh, worth checking out. Especially if you're a comic book fan, I think it's must watch. But it's also just like for, for anyone following along, like if you're making this painting right now and you're curious who the artist actually is, You know, one of the the odd things about him is that there's really there's about six photographs of Steve Ditko that exist. Like, and I'm not kidding. You can do a quick search online, look for photographs of Steve Ditko. You will find the same five or six photos rep replicated all over the place, and that's it. And he was just a reclusive guy did not want his photo taken did not do a lot of press or media barely any interviews with him exist at all so let's uh can I do this left side of his body here I'm going to do the logo in a little bit. I think I might even rotate the canvas around to do part of that, but we'll see. So I'm just going to skip over that. Let's do his arm here. So in fact, I may even just look at this. And This is something I did, but this is my version of these lines, trying to, to look inside with my x-ray vision into all of that... Uh, into the shadows. Something a little bit like that. Got an elbow right here somewhere. Again, we look at this elbow. Actually, might have been a she could be a little bit higher up there, but which might make this slightly awkward. I love these little frog fingers that he's got here. This is, I think, really beautiful. 
beautiful little attention to detail here. And I can, you know, this is the type of thing I can imagine why he would have been so angry at um, Stan Lee for denying his contribution to Spider-Man. Oddly enough, he didn't even care about the money. In fact, he was offered lots of money over the years for his contribution to Spider-Man, and he turned it down. And he died in relative obscurity in a f relatively modest apartment in New York City when he could have been uh, like a millionaire many times over. I think they tried to like offer him shares or something. Um, you know, Stan Lee was a, a friend of, they were good friends and I think Stan Lee was kind of hurt that Steve Ditko just bailed all of a sudden, you know, right when they were doing really well. But as I said, um, uh, increasingly, Steve Ditko was becoming obsessed with Ayn Rand and objectivism. And uh, that uh, he just... He had some very basically moral objections to to the idea of of making money off of a character which he felt had changed beyond his original intent, and he did not want to compromise. And if the character was compromised, then he didn't uh, want any ownership of it. Very interesting. You know, there's not a lot of people who would turn down like almost infinite supply of money because they have creative differences over the storyline. You know, they'd be, at some point they'd be like, yeah, you know what, who cares? If, just cut me a check and I'll go and sit on Bahamas and have a margaritas for the rest of my life. Nope. That's not what Steve Ditko did. Steve Ditko is like, no. This is the way Spider-Man should be. If you're not going to do Spider-Man the way I want Spider-Man to do and the way I envisioned him to be, then I have no part in Spider-Man. I don't even want the proceeds from it because they're tainted. <laughs> you know, just... Very... Very, uh, you know, I, I can admire his principles, but you know, especially being a father and having kids or a kid myself, I'm like, I don't think my wife would be too happy if I turned down millions of dollars just on principle, especially, especially because the principle that he was so upset about. For, for many people, is sort of like, what? Really? Things like Spider-Man should stay in high school. That's that's where you're drawing the line. That's why, like... Hmm. Interesting. But, you know, I think we all... There's all, all of us have things in our lives that, you know, we're... You know, a line that we just won't cross for, and some other people are like, "That's that guy's nuts." Like, seriously, that's. All right, I'm sure. And then we have other friends who have other lines that they won't cross, that we don't understand, right? Life, what a wondrous thing. We're such weird creatures. <laughs> and that's what makes us so great, too, I think, is how strange we are. You know, one day when robots are running everything, maybe that's already happening. Maybe we're all in the Matrix right now. But, uh, 
Oh, and you see there's this little blob of black there. I can try to wipe it away a bit, but I'll just, when I do the webs later on, or the shadow on there, I'll just make, I'll just sort of incorporate that little extra blob. Or I can widen his, the, the outline of his head there a bit. Um... Like, and it's so interesting that, that Steve Ditko, even, so, he has this, this falling out with Stan Lee, and, um, and then yet decides to, uh, to go to DC and illustrate existing characters created by other people that have backgrounds which you may or may not identify with but is you know and uh, or even like painting mighty morphin power rangers you know it's like what would be the 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 comparison elsewhere in you know it, it would be like you know can you um it would be like Brad Pitt leaving film to make to to go on you know uh, tour like uh, doing children's plays in high school like it's just I don't, for I mean obviously probably he probably made some good money doing that actually um, being such a hugely licensed property but it d does seem like. A strange detour to go into. But, you know, this is also, like, similar to... Okay, so that line is maybe a little bit sharper than I should have been. I don't mind it like that, though. Um... It's interesting to think about, like, we've we've looked at... This is our third superhero after doing Batman, or, or... Yeah, we started with Batman. Did we do Batman first and then Superman? I can't remember. Either way, both... Um, they're, they're, like, there's a lot of... Uh, um, controversy around, like, all of those characters and their creators and... I think a big part of it was money, obviously. That a lot of them, you know, there's when we did Batman, there was the issues between um, Bob Kane and Bill Finger. Remember, if you recall, Bob Kane was the he was sort of like the Stan Lee of of Batman, although he really only did a few characters of of renown. Um, but had a big falling out with Bill Finger, who claimed to be the person that kind of originally came up with the look of um, Batman, and who was basically cut out of the of the the profits for many years. So you have Bill Finger kind of also dies in obscurity and poverty. You have um, we talked about. Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, and uh, Joe Schuster, the um, also getting completely uh, screwed over from the profits of Superman all the way until you know invented Superman in the 30s, or was it late late 30s, early 40s? I can't remember now. I should know this, um, considering we painted it, but that seems like ages ago. But uh, 
It wasn't until the, the Superman movie in 78, I think it was, with Christopher Reeve that Warner Brothers was so afraid of the backlash that they eventually decided to cut him a little bit of cash, pay for his um, medical bills, etc. And then you have here Spider-Man going, uh, his creator Steve Ditko likewise also running into a number of issues. So, this arm, I think. So that hand looks a little wide right now. I think as we come in and start refining it, we'll, we'll uh, take care of that. So I'm just gonna finish this a little bit and then we'll zoom out and take a look. Definitely lost a bit of its shape there, but that's okay. So let's see where we are now. Oops, come on. There we go. The chat looks like it's quieted down significantly. Still a few people painting along with me, but um, definitely far less people than there were at the beginning. Interesting. Um, now this blue definitely looks a little bit brighter than it was earlier. Remember when we had them side by side and I felt like that was going to be too dark and I lightened it up even more? Well, there you go. It's kind of, it looks a little bit brighter. The only thing I would say, it is possible that we're still missing a bunch of black lines on here and I think it will get a little bit darker shortly. Um, okay. So we have, obviously, we're going to do work on his face. We're going to put the webbing outfit onto um, the red, uh, outline this, and then we've got the shadows to do, possibly even a little bit on some of these bricks. Maybe, you know, again, I like the way that some of these bricks look a little bit darker and some are a little bit lighter, so we'll do a little bit more of that as we go into the background as well. I'll estimate that we're, I would say, about one hour from being totally done which I know might sound like a long time but uh, I think that will we'll get a really cool painting done by the end here okay Whew. so I think now we we sent we feel the sense of his form as I said those shadows when we get the shadows on there's gonna pull him back onto the wall and it'll help make it a little look a little bit more sense. I even think I might do a little bit of small glazing of some shadows on his body, which we did on the Superman as well, that I think really worked really nicely. Very Again, something that would not really be possible with the, um, uh, as with the printing process back in the 1960s. But since we've already taken some liberties with this background and the brick wall, I think we'll, we'll be pretty cool. Okay. So actually, before I, I do anything, I'm just gonna, I've been painting with this black paint for the past half hour or so. I just wanna well, clean that brush off and start anew. Just cause I find like the black paint tends to dry. I don't know if it's if it dries faster just the way I use it. So it tends to get kind of chunky and it just sort of becomes a bit of a pain to use. I'm going to put a bit of um, glazing fluid. You can do slow dry medium. The one thing with the slow dry medium is it slows the drying period down and if you're doing a lot of outlining it can then you know if, it's, if you've got a lot of wet paint still on there you might accidentally you know, rub it with your hand and then it goes all over the place and then you're like, ah, wish I hadn't done that because now i got to fix the background. And So 
I'm going to use the glazing fluid just to give this paint a little bit more brushability. Now there are other fluids that we have that I have, but um, rather than introduce more and more and more different mediums and then you've got a, like me a shelf full of dozens of different materials, I just want to try to use the small number of materials that I've suggested for this uh, series of videos so that because there's, yeah, there's lots of different things that we can keep on adding to the paint over and over and over again, but at some point you have to just be like, okay, I'm just beginning, I don't want to spend hundreds of extra dollars on all these other things that I don't, might only use once. And if you don't have all those, and I'm starting to use other materials you don't have, then of course you're going to get a different result than I do. So I want to try to, I'm always trying to, like, how can I show people that I can do exactly what you do at home? Um, so... Uh, where was I? Speaking of this, I might, I'm going to blow dry all of this. And then I'm going to go back up to the left corner to the foot. I think what I'm going to do is I'll do the webbing. We'll paint all the webbing, including the logo on his face. And then after, I'll go back and widen some of the lines on his, like, his body uh, to give a little bit more dynamic features like I'll just keep all these lines right now And I know that they're different than this, you know, we've got some thicker and wider lines here and there But let's just get the the patterning on his clothes done first So let's zoom back in here Ah, oh, there's Steven Hi Steven Yeah, it feels like forever since we last chatted I know Amy will be happy. Stephen is my wife's uh, uncle. Okay, so now let's... Uh, I'm also not going to do every little bit of the patterning on these clothes, right? So we just have to also make some uh, decisions to remove a few, a few things here. Notice how that line doesn't quite connect, or we can connect it to there, but I don't mind if it kind of just ends there, because sometimes like at the bottom of our feet tend to kind of wear at things. That's just a little subtle thing of my own on there. So that line was a little bit thick and wide there. I probably could have got away with not even putting that line there, but it is what it is. Now there's a wrinkle on his foot there. And then let's... You, I, I've seen some of you in this class taking, like, say, markers, sharpies to do some of this. It would probably affect the overall long-term life of that painting if you start putting sharpies over top of it, and it might not do so well in, in bright light. That sharpie could kind of fade a little bit, but... And do whatever makes you happy. Again, I might take... I will take some glazing fluid at some, towards the very end, and it might work really well 
especially in some of these areas, let's say in the foot. Now you can see how he darkened some of those lines. I'm just going to leave it like this. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to tackle all of those darker, wider lines shortly. I just want to get the patterning in here first. I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but comic book artists paint on pieces of paper that are usually at least twice the size of the origin or of what you see in the comic book. So if you've ever seen comic book art for sale, you see these large pieces of paper. And that's because they they paint on much larger surfaces and then they reduce it for print, which makes everything look really nice when it gets smaller. Um, so this original image, I guarantee you, is somewhere along the lines of something around like 20, you know, by maybe even bit you're like 22 by, in fact, let's just take a second to, um, Uh, 11 by 17 many of them are much bigger than 11 by 17 12 by 18 okay I thought they were bigger than that but um, but you can see if, once the comic book is reduced it goes from 11 by 17 down to like six by ten or so. That uh, all of a sudden everything just looks a lot cleaner and nicer, which is another reason why your painting might look really nice from far away, and then when you get up close to it, might fall apart a little bit. That's generally what happens to every painting and everyone's artwork. You know, it's, it's only like the, the greatest artist of all time where you get up close and it might even look better than it does from far away. Like all this stuff, like this is all Steve Ditko right here, right? Not Stan Lee. I mean, Stan Lee is, it was a genius. Like he, he was an incredible writer, incredible visionary. Many of the characters came out of his imagination that we, we know so well today. A lot of the, the the language, he, Stan Lee would, would not only write many of the stories, but he would often, you know, we're talking like 20 different comic books that Marvel was producing, he would often come up with the dialogue balloons, you know, the, the, the words that were in the, the word balloons, the sound effects, he would do a lot of that stuff himself. So the kind of particular kind of... Um, would you say the attitude of Marvel Comics, the, the kind of the humor that he had is really 
it's definitely very Stan Lee. Even to the point in um, in that documentary, that the Jonathan Ross one that I mentioned, In Search of Steve Ditko, you can hear an early... Sorry, I was just zooming in and out to seeing if what I want to do next. Um, you can hear a, a clip of Stan Lee talking about like the... He's doing like a radio ad from like 1964 or something. We're talking just a few years after Spider-Man was released, and it sounds like something that Stan Lee would have done in the 90s. And it's really, it to me, it was kind of like a bit of an eye opener, thinking like, wow, he Stan Lee was always like that. Always had that kind of goofy personality, like this. Um. Like a very sincere, kind of almost like to the point of, of silliness. That obviously endeared him to generations of comic book fans. I see in the chat, Paula says, my red is too red on Spider-Man. I don't know what to do. Interesting. Uh, so if the if the red is too dark, you know, what you can do is you can paint over it with a little, add a little bit of white into the red and paint over top of it. You want to be very careful about putting too much white into it, otherwise it's going to go very pink very quickly. You, um, you, like, what I, if you recall what I did here, is I painted... Uh, I was afraid of exactly what you're talking about, Paul, of this red being too dark. So I, I, I originally put some white into my red, painted that, and it went kind of pink. And then I painted my this final coat of red over top of it. So that, um, and this, this red over top was just right out of the tube. So, and that's just something that comes with a little bit of practice, like... Um, because both of these reds, as, as a lot of reds are, are fairly transparent, if you paint red over top of another color, often you see some of that other color coming in underneath. So, um, yeah, just something that tends to happen. So, whereas the white paint has, is a kind of opaque quality that if you add that to it, it just will kind of cover and hide anything. So, really, if you just keep trying to paint the same red over top of the red that's there, the problem is, is not going to go away. It's just going to keep almost like getting darker and darker and darker. If you paint over top a little bit of white, it'll get that, that I think, the lighter, more vibrant red that you want. Okay. So, where should we go here? You can also see um, times where you want to kind of keep some of these lines from touching other lines, like particularly around the head. Just sort of helps create this little bit of effect where the head is sitting separately from the shoulders so that they're not, the head is, is a little bit ahead of the rest of the body. <laughs> the head is ahead of the body. Okay. Um... many of these we, we want to have four three stripes inside here right just doing the math in my mind here
Okay. So there's a little bit of some kind of confusion up here, but I, I, what I'm going to do, I think, is I'm going to do a lot more of these, uh, the long lines. And then I'll come back in and do some of the, I don't know, the webbing in between these lines. I don't know how to... Look how this these lines are now going to curve around the top of his like that line here. It's not just straight. We want to get them curvy so that we sense that there's a like the shape of his his head, right? You know, one of the things I was, when I was putting together this episode, a small little detail, is I noticed that Spider-Man is spelt with a hyphen. And that was something deliberately, that's a Stan Lee kind of thing. He wanted to create a difference between Batman and Superman. He wanted, it's like, even just by adding that little hyphen, he's like, um... Batman is one word, Superman is one word. It's, I find that kind of, those little tiny things that authors sometimes do is like really fascinating. Probably one of the most fascinating things along those lines I can think of is how when, like Thomas Jefferson, the former American president, he made a very specific decision to, uh, to create it. To, to change the American spelling of notable English words to create a difference between America and Great Britain. And that's why we have color spelt different in, in I guess, so-called American or American English versus British English. Or here in Canada, we tend to use all of the British spellings of things. But that was a, a conscious decision that he made because he's like you know what as a as our as a country we want to have our own spelling of things <laughs> seems a little bit silly but uh you know i i can also understand it makes it it's it goes to show the power of language Right, which he clearly understood. You know, there's a little. This is a little bit goofy in here. I'm not going to worry about that. Oh, that was supposed to go here, right? You know, all will be cleared up. It's funny to me, like, some people will say, like, oh, you know, the, the hardest paintings in this class will be the, you know, the traditional paintings, like Mona Lisa or something. And those comic book ones, that's for the kids. <laughs> and then anyone who's painting these, like, wow, those are some of those, those lines and detailing. That's no joke, right? Uh, as I said, I'm going to let that dry and then we'll come back. So let's go to this. Uh, maybe we'll do the other foot up here. Or no, that might be where my hand is. Let's do this here.
You can see how like those bulging lines like that help us understand that that's the muscle that's underneath all of that costume? Very smart. His, I mean, this, again, if you think about, like, this costume would have been quite strange and different. You know, Superman, you could see his entire face. Batman, even though he was in disguise, you could see part of his face. Most superheroes up until this time, you could see their face. Spider-Man was one of the first to have, like, a fully covered face. Which might not sound like a big deal, but again, if you think it's it's that would have been was different, right? It was like oh, I thought, you know, why would a hero want to cover their face? That seems like a very particularly unheroic type of uh, a gesture. And in there becomes kind of the trademark part of Marvel Comics. Where you have heroes that are conflicted, that are maybe not necessarily sure they even want to be heroes. And and also on top of that, a, a public, the people who live in these cities surrounded by superheroes, also have uh, a... Um, Uh, how would you call it? Like a... Oops, that was maybe a line was supposed to go there, but... Now I see why that line went here. Hmm. Don't like that, but... Maybe we can fix some of that in the shadow. Um... Yeah, I mean, a particular kind of part of Marvel Comics is is the relationship between the public and the heroes, and which is exemplified particularly in uh, the X Men, where you have uh, people who don't want the X Men, and there's basically. I think it was kind of a stand-in for kind of racial tensions in the 1960s of of how do how do people mutants exist um, you know when there's this there's these prejudices against them and um, you know World War II you had all these uh, African Americans who went to fight. And to preserve, to, to you know, um, keep everyone in the United States safe, and then they come back, and they're treated as second-class citizens. Same, you know, like so they're heroes, but they're not certainly not treated like heroes. So anyway, there's so many interesting things that we could talk about relating to um, superheroes and. You know, they seem like child's play, but there's there's a lot of deeper. Um, you know, they, they they come from a. They 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 didn't just appear out of nowhere, right? They came out of particular con kind of conditions, especially Marvel in the 1960s when all these characters are born, right? So they're they're products of their particular time. Okay, so let's, uh, maybe let's, should we just do the, his eyes here real quick? Take care of that since they seem kind of, uh, 
just going to begin by kind of outlining where the white was. to this other side. That's okay for right now. We'll see. I think as I start getting more and more lines on here, I think things might change a little bit. But uh, let's let's see. What do we need to do? Let's get the some of these lines all over his costume in here. left a little bit too oops let's go this way here we're just gonna do you know it's a little bit different than the original but it doesn't matter it matters what my painting looks like because unless somebody is standing next to the painting with their phone or a poster then it doesn't matter what the... I gotta make mine work. Now I'm not looking at the original f really except just occasionally for just to make sure there's nothing radically different. But I kind of take a little snapshot with my mind and I'm like okay all of these are kind of bowl shaped arcs so So this is interesting, in this area right here, it's where his wrist is really kind of compressed. And so we're going to see a bunch of these lines kind of 
bending together right here to show that and then spreading back out again. I guess he's got like a lot more small little lines in there than I do. next that's interesting I would have expected these arcs to go the other way to go up and out but they're going the opposite So there's a little bit of this right inside here between his eyes. There's always been a bit of a place where it's a little blank. details it's getting better folks getting better every moment right so remember there's been times where this painting has looked eh, not so great it's just a matter of just we just kept plowing forward and just kept getting better and better little bit by little bit Since I did this on the other arm just for consistency, I'm just going to do that there. There's going to be a, a number of these little marks that later on I'm going to go back in and tidy up. That I'm not focused at this moment in fixing. I want to just get as much down here as possible and then later on give it some a little bit more attention.
<laughs> that forearm looks pretty funny, but uh, let me think. I mean, there's. Do I want to try to fix it? Do I want to, I could show maybe how I would fix it, I suppose. I know all these little lines are pretty tricky for a lot of people, so don't worry about doing every single one of them. If you have trouble with them, maybe do less lines. The idea behind these lines right here is they're getting closer together because they're intending to show the hand like really pressed down against the surface and really kind of bending back and the tremendous amount of pressure and weight it would be on them if you were really kind of stuck against the wall and your all of your weight is on your hands really okay and then we just have the foot so then now we're getting getting closer to doing shadows and really giving a little bit more form to this body brush is I should make a few goofies on there So let's just take a look and see where we are at this point now. Oh, here we go. Uh, but looks pretty good. It's pretty good so far. Already he sort of appears to be pretty more integrated into the into the wall than he than he was earlier, right? So. Um, let's take a little second to clean a few brushes. So the next step is I want to go over top of these lines. You can see like all of the texture of these muscles and things. I want to do that. That's going to really help another big step. And then really from there, we're just gonna, we'll do some shadows. So we're now we're just gonna tighten up the actual form. And I think that will really help. Some of these lines are gonna get much thicker. And then we'll do the shadows, which we're just gonna, I'm gonna do them as a glaze. You could also just do them as black. And I think you'd be totally fine doing that. But I'm just gonna do a darker glaze. I think it's gonna look really cool. And then we can also add a little bit more of that onto the body. So, I'm going to get just a little bit more glazing fluid on there. I think I've got enough black still. So, as I said, you, you want to be careful with the glazing fluid because it's going to make the color more transparent. It's going to make it a little bit more brushable or a little bit less or a little bit more... Um, uh, what is not? It's gonna, is it going to increase the viscosity? I can can never remember. It's, uh, my science high school science class. 
it's gonna just gonna make it a, a little bit thinner and and uh, increase the brushability this artist will often talk about anyway get my actually now I've got all this paint built up there I hate when that happens it also speeds up the drying of all the paint on there so I'll just get a little bit more there we go so There's going to be a few little places I need to just get a bit more red to touch things up. Okay. That Spider-Man theme song. Dun, 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 dun. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. That is a catchy song. <laughs> like, even if you don't like Spider-Man, you have heard that song somewhere. Maybe when you were a kid in the playground and you didn't even know who Spider-Man was, but I'm sure you've heard of it. Okay, actually, I'm just going to blow dry all this. Let's mute this. Okay, so yeah, let's take a look at his legs here. Come on. So let's this calf muscle here. This is his knee. I mean, goodness, like, there is some gorgeous attention to anatomy here. Wow. That's really beautiful as I look at it, especially teach, since I teach anatomy at university. It, it's always nice to see people who are, do it really, really well. And I've, I remember I had a teacher when I was in art school, uh, his name's Mike Kelly, who's since passed away, but he, he made the brilliant observation that comic books carried on the, the Beaux-Arts style of, of, of figurative illustration that was dropped by so-called high art, right? Like Jackson Pollock and the abstract expressionists, they, they abandoned the figure to work to make abstract painting you know in the 1940s and 50s and it was comic books that took up that task of, of keeping the figurative uh, art tradition alive uh, I thought that was like super perceptive because again comic books are are derided by some people even to this day as just being kind of silly you know guilty pleasure or whatever but there is some 
some of the greatest artists of the 20th century were comic book artists. And it's, it's, it's really hard. I mean, the fact that they were sort of relegated to, obs to obscurity when if they were living during the Renaissance would have been the most powerful artists in the world at the time is like, is really kind of bizarre and sad. So I'm just going to go across the, the, the body like this. come back to his back. Hmm. Looks like my spider got a little bit skewed onto the left. I was thinking of that earlier, but it seems more and more apparent now. So some of this is pretty tough, like, you know, if you find this a little bit difficult, then you could be totally fine leaving the, the, the body as it was before we kind of embarked on this phase of things. also kind of hide some of this in a really dark deep shadow. I'm going to do as I said glazes for it but gonna leave it although it doesn't make me super happy just because if I try to start working on that area I think it's just gonna get worse so sometimes you just gotta take it and just move on it might be okay we'll see
So I'm just going to kind of thicken the tops of these fingers. It's like shadows. Same thing. Since I okay, so here since I did this so dark and so wide. I think I need to do the same thing on this other arm. It also means that I'm going to have to come down here and just darken around his chin and make the bottom part of his head even a bit at the top a bit wider. Because now these lines are competing with that shoulder. Yeah, you know, it's like a little, you know, sometimes those things happen, you're painting. You goof up a little bit. It's just thinking about, like, it doesn't mean everything's ruined. It's just, like, you got to integrate that line into the rest of the painting. It's going to look a little bit different than his iconic style, but... would involve to really fix this. I think that's helping. Obviously, I could just make this, I'll, that'll be a part of the shadow here. So I'm just thinning out that forearm, which got just way too wide accidentally. You can even see some of the original red there. But, you know, minor detail, right? Okay. Let's come back up here. See why I was saving all of this to this particular point? Because I didn't, I didn't know what needed to get thicker or thinner before. Now I have a much clearer idea. In fact, I'll probably widen his his thigh on the other leg uh, after this too, so... Oops, I can't even see what... I'm just doing my own thing here, but I should probably take a look at what the master did, right?
Knees are really weird, funny, goofy parts of the human body. So you can't go wrong with sort of adding weird little lumps and bumps and on on knees, right? I think we all know kind of funny looking knees can can appear, right? So uh, it's certainly a you can just sort of do your best and fake it out a little bit too. Not so sure what's what he's up to there. Ah, I see. That's a little anatomy wise, I think I've a little goofy, but Okay, so we want to get this kind of shadow under here. Okay, and then I'm just going to come back onto the other side. Since I got a big shadow, sorry, right here, I want to give this, widen his other thigh a little bit. i got to be careful. Otherwise, I'm going to start widening every part of his the muscles on his body. The, what did I say? The muscles? Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 Same thing with this back leg. So really you want the darkest parts of his body to be closest to us. So I don't want to go too nuts doing all of that. Uh, like on his behind here. Okay, so let's zoom out and take a look at this. Right, so you could see, remember I, I would start outlining the head. All of that stemmed from this mark that I put down here. It was kind of a little bit too wide. So I decided, well, it's too wide, so I gotta start widening the other side. And then I was like, okay, well, I gotta widen part of his his chin or at least the because that needs to otherwise this the shoulder is going to look like it's closer to us so i had to and then outlining a few i i it certainly looks a little bit different than his but um doesn't bother me i feel like i gotta come down here these fingers are widen just a bit Cool. Doesn't that look pretty cool? I'm pretty happy with the way this looks right now. Okay. So, the final steps here are to add some shadows onto the, onto the wall. And potentially a little bit of delicate glazing onto some of the parts of his body. 
Um, I think that would work well. And then, we, of course, we could do little bits of darkening a few bricks here and there. In fact, if anything, if we do want to do that, we should probably think about doing that first. I think. Let me see. Take a second here. Whew. A little stretch on before we move into the final part of the painting. I, I really like, I feel, I've, I'm excited about the my instinct to, to put these bricks here. I think that, that works really well considering this character. Um, I'm going to blow dry, uh, or actually, let's do the bricks and then I'll, because I'll, that will allow everything to kind of dry a little bit. So I'm going to put this brush in the water. Let's mix a bit another cool uh, brown, just like we did originally. Uh, I just need, I need some more color on here. So we need some more cool yellow. Not much of it. Cool blue. And we got some cool red still there, so... So let me just, oh, I'm so, okay. So later, so on Tuesday of this week, we are doing a painting by Ted Harrison, who if you've never heard of Ted Harrison is an amazing artist. He passed away just a few years ago, um, known for these very, actually very, you know, it's, it's got a bit of a comic book quality to, um, to his, uh, to his artwork it'll be kind of interesting looking at his work after having painted spider-man of all things um okay so i put way too much blue in here obviously if i put that in there it's just going to be way too intense so let's um let's get some of this paint off and take this cool yellow and just move this separately just mix it again Like if I tried to fix that by adding more yellow to it, it's that would just take me probably like uh, three, four times as much paint as just mixing it again right down here. And I didn't even have to clean my brush. Took the existing color that I had on here and just remade it down here. Now that's still a little bit dark. If anything, since we're about to start, we might as well just kind of start glazing a little bit here. Um, that'll allow us to be pretty subtle with any new effects that we put in here. So I just took some uh, satin glazing liquid fluid. Uh, satin is matte, right? It, it does. It's not shiny. If you want shiny, then you go for the gloss glaze. Personally, I like uh, my colors to be matte, and if I want it to be glossy, then I'll put a glossy varnish over the whole thing at the very, very end, after it's dried for a few weeks. Um, so now, let's, uh, which bricks should we darken here? I'm not going to do all of them. Just a few here and there. We can even these are we're going to put shadows over all of this, but still a little bit of it'll we want a bit of variation even in the shadows themselves, right? that little bit of variation oh that just makes everything so cool I love it that's something that w would be very hard to do in the comic book at least the comic books of the time comic books today have quite advanced printing that can do all sorts of super subtleties so 
it's no longer an issue, but um, and so you feel free to put do this wherever you want. The one thing I would say is think about trying to create some uh, variety and trying to be. Um, you want to kind of almost randomize this particular process so that we're not getting the same, like a checkerboard thing where every second one is darker. come up and do the same thing here in the top. Let's get a smaller brush for this. Oops, that's... I'm not going to spend too much time on this here. Just, just enough. So this is kind of a more predominantly blue. Let's just get a bit of more reddish quality. Decide where you think your bricks need to get darker. And then places, you know, where the I put these white lines and they might have been a little bit heavy handed. Boom, just a little bit of this over top kind of takes care of that. Is that good enough? Can I 
walk away from that happy? I think so. Sometimes this painting, painting can be like a curse. You just like want to keep going. It's almost, there's definitely times where I'm working on a painting where I just don't want it to stop. Like a good novel, you're just like, oh, I'm enjoying how this is looking. This is fun. This is great. Okay, so those are all some cool colors in the background. Um, we could, we should, we could do the same thing with the shadow. Give it a cool shadow underneath here. So, um, I'm going to blow dry this because I've done some glazing. If I put wet glaze over top of glaze, it's not quite dry. Then I'm just going to scrub that glaze off. It's going to be a pain and you're going to, uh, won't be happy. So I'm just going to mute my microphone and we'll. <laughs> Paul says, um, I'm using gouache vermilion to lighten the red. That's okay. He just changed to a new outfit. <laughs> Donna says, LOL, his lighter one is in the laundry. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's actually a number of different costumes that uh, Spider-Man has had over the years as well. Like, no joke. So, you know, if your character has slightly different color, you know, like... During the kind of 90s, a lot of superheroes just sort of went darker. All the colors got a little bit... Everything just sort of got a little bit more edgier. Um, and probably, like, Spider-Man's... The blue in Spider-Man's outfit, I'm sure, got much darker, warmer than this. This is a, a pretty cool blue. So it would have gotten much darker and... Um, Versus like the 60s, Spider-Man was a, l a lot more pop, kind of a little bit sillier almost, right? I just, I need a bit more warm blue. There's a few little things I wanted to touch up here. Barely need any paint to do that. where it still looked a little bit on the pinkish side. So just taking my warm red and just doing a quick little touch up. Okay. That's one of these things you just see more stuff the more you look. Okay. That's pretty good. Okay, so now let's uh, finish it off by a little bit of glazing, ideally, knock on wood. Um, so I think I'm just going to use this glaze that, that I mixed here. 
I'm gonna put maybe, what should we do, a little bit, let's make a purple and we'll inject it into this color. Because the purples are always uh, a nice color in opposition to, like in the shadows, purple is just always just a nice color. So let's take some of this cool blue, let's take some of the warm, sorry, cool red, warm blue, I get this purple. Now on its own, that's going to be, well, that wouldn't be too bad. It might be a little bit weird, but uh, if we use that as in the shadow, I'm just going to wipe off this excess paint. So I'm just spinning my brush here. I'm just going to wipe off that excess paint. And then I'm going to take some of this other, this the um, paint I was using to darken the bricks and just get some of this purple into the mixture. So now we have a combination of the darker, these slightly darker bricks with the purple. And then we got glazing fluid we mix into this just to thin it out a little bit, make it a little bit more transparent. Okay. And again, I think I'm just going to squeeze that paint out, wipe off my brush, because I got all these darker pigments in here, and I want it just, I don't want it to go too dark. So if anything, I'm just gonna take a bit more. <clears throat> Glazing fluid splops up into the air, and luckily not all over everything. So we might do two layers of this. We'll see how well, how dark this goes when we first put it on here. So places where there's the shadow is this knee area right here. Okay, I'm just gonna get more purple on there and just go darker quicker. Now it's not nearly as dark as I want it to be, but I'm going to let it sit there for, uh, we'll let it dry. While I do a few other places. Yeah, it needs to just go much darker, doesn't it? Oh, that was a cold blue. Now I may have to do a little bit more outlining with my black. But what is really nice is look how the, the bricks are uh, also going dark or the, in the mortar between them.
Subtle there. Let's go to the other hand. Let's get a smaller brush for this. Now, potentially, we could have done some of this before we even did the black lines. Uh, that would have worked as well. It probably would have been a little bit trickier for some people, just because you wouldn't have actually... It would have just been a lot of uh, painting on faith that it's going to work out later on, whereas at least when you have the black lines, you're like, okay, I feel like we're on the right track. I can see where things are, but... Zoom back out. Oops. Here, take a look. Um, okay. So that is working. I, I am compelled to do a little bit of this actually on the body itself. And if I was to do that, let's see. I think I'll add a little bit more glazing fluid. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wipe off my brush. This is something. This is definitely an extra little bit, which we will see very quickly here whether it works or not. I'm gonna do this really, really subtly, or with a great subtlety. The same color. You can see the effect it has, like pretty transparent. Um, and then let's just paint this. Just a few little places here. I think it might be able to go just a bit darker.
So, I think I want to do a, just a, I'm going to blow dry this and maybe just darken his shadow one more time with the same glaze. I think I might be fine with his body in every part of it. I think that's good. Yeah, so we're, I think we're like two minutes away from being done. So let's um, blow dry. Okay, so I'm going to go into the shadows one last time with uh, this dark kind of purple that I've got. Let's make sure we got some glaze in there. It's not just a solid color. And we can see that's the resulting mix. Um, let's show the original side by side again. So I'm just going to go, I could paint, I guess I could do all of the shadow. One thing you could possibly do is just kind of like the, the, the place. Maybe I'll do that. I'll, I'll do this. And then I'll do a, a slightly darker version. Kind of close, really close to the underside of his body. Because it might be nice to have a few. Um, slightly different levels of shadow. Zoom in. All right, we'll go to this area here. So obviously this is, I'm taking some pretty big liberties with the original, but it is kind of fun. Like once you've got it down on here, right, you can, I think you should be, uh, feel free to have a little bit of fun. It's your painting after all, remember, right? Let's zoom out a bit. Maybe just a little bit darker. Okay. I think I could be, what's going on here with that thumb? Let's go get some black on here.
So we darkened things with the glaze. Now the thing is, is that if you painted the glaze over top of your black lines, you actually lightened up the black lines ever so slightly. So it might be worth just a quick little moment. Just to go over any of those lines. Because they will look a little bit foggy with that glaze over top of them. I don't know, I think that's good enough. Okay, I'm gonna have to <laughs> been painting way too long. But I you know, I get excited about these things. I just wanna keep going. So that's that makes me happy seeing those those two paintings side by side or two images side by side. Um they're different because I took some liberties on mine. I figured, well, I'm making a painting. Let's take advantage of this opportunity. I'm not trying to hide the fact that I'm making a painting and I don't want it to, I'm not trying to simulate the look of a, of a printing press. Say this was this particular one is from 1964. So I was, was going to do I want to do 1962, but 1964 was when this image was created. I know it. I, right, that's enough. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. That feels pretty good. It's definitely, I feel like it's a nice dynamic picture. I'm satisfied with my instinct to use the brick wall. Whenever I just think of Spider-Man, I just think of a guy climbing up and down walls, uh, as opposed to the original image, which was, I don't know what that was. Uh, it might have been in the original comic. Maybe it was some sort of bad guy's hideout or something, or uh, art deco structure, I don't know. But anyway, there's our Spider-Man painting to celebrate Spider-Man Day, as well as the incredible genius of Steve Ditko. And without him, despite what Stan Lee says, I don't think Spider-Man would have been uh, the character it would have been. Um, not nearly as successful, which Stan Lee acknowledges that it... That uh, but he says if it was if it wasn't as successful it wouldn't have been as successful and it would have just he would have moved on and he would have had success with something else anyway I strongly encourage you to watch that documentary we talked about at the beginning in search of Steve Ditko fascinating interview with Stan Lee again I would be so interested to know what you think in the comments who is the creator of Spider-Man is it Stan Lee the guy who came up with the idea who wrote the story for Spider-Man, because that's what Stan Lee believes, or is it Steve Ditko, who took that germ of an idea and transformed it into the visual that we see here uh, and ultimately created many of the most famous characters, including Venom and Dr. Octopus and the Green Goblin, J. Jonah Jameson, um, Gwen Stacy, etc. Um... Or are they both equally responsible for creating Spider-Man? I think it's a fascinating question. Um, and that's something people have been arguing about for decades. There's a, certainly a number of people who are hardcore Steve Ditko fans who would say unquestionably Steve Ditko is the ultimately the creator of Spider-Man because without it... it it, 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 we, he, he could be some robot guy with, you know, who just looked very different. Um, 
And then there's obviously some, there's probably more people who are bigger fans of, of Stan Lee because he's obviously just a global brand, even though he passed away a few years ago. But um, it was sort of the face of comic books for generations. Very interesting uh, conversation. Anyway... Um, what else can I say that I want to end with, um, Steve Ditko? Uh, yeah, it makes me want to go watch all the Spider-Man movies. I haven't seen the most recent one, the Homecoming, Spider-Man Homecoming. It's supposed to be, have some scenes that, uh, that are nods to Steve Ditko. So I, 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 I wouldn't even have a clue as to how they would have done that. So I'm curious. That's on my playlist of one, some of the dozens of movies that I got to see over the next little while. But uh, anyway, thank you everyone for joining me. Um, if you enjoyed today's episode, please like and subscribe to the channel. That's all you got to do. That helps me immensely, right? We're slowly climbing up to 10,000 subscribers. Probably by the end of summer we'll be there, so I'm excited to do that. That'll be a huge honor for me, and I can't think what I'm going to do to celebrate that. Um, as well, if you want to leave a donation, there's a PayPal link in the description below. Uh, there's been some really nice, generous donations over the past week, so I'm really grateful for all of your contributions. Um, that certainly goes to buy th new things like the microphones and cameras and all that. Um, so I really appreciate your support. That really means a lot. Even if it's just a, f a couple dollars here and there, um, all of those little donations add up to uh, better and better episodes, right? Hopefully you'll agree, especially if you go back and look at the ones I was doing a year ago. So we'll see you on Tuesday. We're going to be painting Ted Harrison painting, and then I think on Thursday we're doing Mabel May, and then the next Tuesday it is Dorothy McCarthy. No, Doris McCarthy, who is, I think, one of the great... So there's going to be Mabel May and Doris McCarthy. Doris McCarthy. And why is it... A little of, are two of, the, I think, the greatest uh, landscape painters in Canadian history. Both of them happen to be female as well. So, and they both kind of have... They were both inspired by people like Lauren Harris and the Group of Seven. So it'll be really interesting. Well, we can have some of those conversations about the influence of the Group of Seven and then also kind of how these women took uh, this particularly male-centric view of the Canadian landscape and gave it their own twist, which I think will be uh, cause for some really interesting conversations. Okay, everyone, thank you for joining me. We'll see you guys in a couple of days. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Where did my stuff go? Hmm. I should have looked at this while I was chatting, but my computer's freezing. Oh, oh no. Okay. Got to close that out. Maybe while this is closing, anything else I can say? Uh, I don't really have anything. I think my brain is... is dead here. Um, Donna says 50-50 split between Stan Lee and Steve Ditko as creators of... I think that's probably where it, it, it... Generally, I think there's a lot of people who would agree with that, but there is certainly some people who feel um, differently, strongly either way. So, um, I just think this is... I'm just getting the spinning wheel of death. I think... Probably my computer is on the verge of overheating, so it wouldn't surprise me if all of a sudden the feed just ends suddenly, as it did on Thursday. So, uh, any second we could end. So maybe we'll just do that. Maybe we'll, uh, before it crashes, why don't we just crash ourselves? We'll see you guys on Tuesday. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. We will see you guys again soon. Good night.